There was an idea. The idea was to bring together a group of remarkable people. Recently, I was invited by a YouTuber called Cinema Hero to join a collaborative project featuring other content creators on this app. A few days ago, Cinema Hero announced that he'd be putting together a collaboration with some of your favorite YouTube content creators involved. I needed something big, something different. And that's when I got an idea. What if I started a project? A project that's bigger than just Cinema Hero. Liftoff will start in T minus 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We have ignition. We open on a tall building's roof as we see a teenage girl step out to the edge with tears in her eyes. She's on the phone with a lady begging her to stop and stay in the apartment, but she drops the phone off the edge. She stands there for a second and closes her eyes when a hand lands on her shoulder. Your doctor really did get held up, Reagan. It's never as bad as it seems. Reagan turns to see Superman standing behind her, looking at her with a smile. You're much stronger than you think you are. Trust me. Regan looks him in the eyes and embraces him. Now, this is the opening scene for this movie, but it's also, of course, an exact adaptation of maybe the most famous scene for maybe the most famous Superman comic, All-Star Superman. Now, this scene is incredibly important to me for a variety of reasons, one of those being how good it is at showing who Superman is as a character. A beacon of hope for those who don't have much, a shining light in the darkness life can be. That's who Superman is, and I think it's very important that that's the first thing we ever see him do in this movie. I should also mention that Clark is being played by Wolfgang Novogratz in this movie. He looks like Clark, and he could definitely play the role, so yeah, we went with him. For the rest of Act 1, we're introduced to different characters, specifically the Daily Planet staff, like Cat Grant, Steve Lombard, Ron Troop, and Perry White. But most importantly, photographer Jimmy Olsen, played by Matt Lintz, and star reporter Lois Lane, played by Emma Mackey. Clark, Lois, and Jimmy work together a lot, and there's a kind of romance between Clark and Lois that continues through the movie. I'm not going to really describe it in detail, but know that it is there and important throughout the entire thing. Anyway, the story they are currently covering is about a movie star coming back to Metropolis named John Corbin. He's played by Scott Eastwood. I think he could really pull off that, like, egotistical, full-of-himself kind of energy I'm looking for for John Corbin, so I picked him. They're doing, like, a big parade for him because he's super famous. I'm thinking just for interactions with the rest of the cast, Lois has an interview with him, and we just see how egotistical he is. We were also introduced to the Kents, specifically Martha, played by Sally Field, as Jonathan, played by Neil Flynn, passed away a couple years ago. I just really want us to see that relationship Clark has with his parents and how important it is to both of them. Because this is a superhero movie too, we need an action scene. So we see a fight between Superman and Parasite voiced by Tony Todd. I think Parasite is really underused and he has a really interesting power. Um, so I figure we use him here. And because it's a Superman movie, unless you're Man of Steel, I guess, we need Lex Luthor, who's being played by Mahershala Ali. He is trying to get rid of Superman, but he realizes that he doesn't have the physical power. He's trying to make an army of robots, but there's nothing that can power them. So he has a different plan, and that's to destroy Superman's image. As a part of this plan, Lex, with science stuff, I guess, is able to kill John Corbin at the Metropolis docks and frame Superman for the crime after footage of the murder is leaked from a nearby security camera that filmed what happened. This is our inciting incident, of course, and leads directly into Act 2. 
Act 2 is mostly focused on Superman trying to clear his name and what the public now thinks of Superman. They're pretty split on what to think about him now. Did he actually murder someone? Is it right to support him if he did murder someone? It's pretty split down the middle, but it's tense. Clark, meanwhile, is trying to clear his name as Superman and as Clark Kent, where he helps Lois and Jimmy search for evidence, who are also sure Superman didn't do this. Their main suspect is Lex Luthor, as it's known that he's done shady dealings in the past. The public has just never been made aware of it, and this is probably something he would do, as they know he hates Superman. Lex Corp also immediately offered support for John Corbin's family and took care of the body after his death and took it to an unknown location. This investigation is mostly what Lois and Jimmy are doing throughout the movie. I should mention too that Superman doesn't stop saving people, even though some hate him and fear him. He's never going to stop fighting, because that's his duty. It would also be good to have a scene here between Clark and his mom, where he asks her what she thinks he should do, and she tells him that he can't stop saving people, because whether the people are scared or not, he knows what he's doing is right. Also early in the second act, we see Superman fight the villain Livewire, played by Elizabeth Gillies, at a museum owned by LexCorp. She would say something like, I knew I was right, you're no hero, or cut it with the Boy Scout routine, everyone knows you're a murderer. We also see a specific rock at the museum weaken Superman when he's near it. Superman is eventually able to beat Livewire despite the rock's effects and gives her over to the police, some of which are also distrusting of Superman. Luther sees the security footage of this fight as it's his museum and sees that the rock can also act as a power source so he uses it to power a robot to fight Superman. Back to Lois and Jimmy, though. They've been investigating around Metropolis, specifically at the docks. They tried to get the footage of the murder from the camera, but it was already taken. They do have another source at the docks, however, Bibbo Babowski, who, after talking around the docks to people who kind of saw what happened, says that the Superman didn't seem really real, like a robotic version or like a copy or something. Also, I think it would be kind of funny to have a thing here where Lois and Jimmy try to talk to the sailors, but they all kind of talk weirdly, so Bibbo has to translate. Anyway, only one person in Metropolis has access to this level of robotics, so Lois and Jimmy head towards LexCorp. Back to Superman, though. The robot is unleashed on Metropolis, so Superman goes to stop it. It talks with a very distorted voice and taunts Superman about his crimes. Superman attempts to attack the robot, but is stopped when he gets close to the robot and feels weakened, so the robot punches him away easily. During the fight, Superman still works to save civilians, but some of them are still really scared of him. The robot, meanwhile, is putting even more people in danger. Eventually, the robot is able to defeat Superman after it fully exposes its kryptonite power source and punches him away far into the distance and deep into the Metropolis Harbor. The robot looks to a crowd of people for applause, but there's nothing. The citizens look around and they see the destruction the villain has caused and see what Superman has done to save people. They all run away in despair and fear, wondering what a world without Superman would look like. The robot leaves the scene as well to cause more destruction across Metropolis. The only people left at the scene are a broken Lois and Jimmy, knowing that Superman is gone, but she's not going to stop not until Lex is brought to justice. Lois looks back at some footage that Jimmy took of the fight and realizes something, so they rush back to the Daily Planet. They enter and run to Lois's computer. They cross-reference footage of the robot talking in an interview earlier with John Corbin, and Lois sees that both of them say the exact same phrase, and it's revealed to us that John Corbin is the robot. We leave the shock on their faces and move towards the TVs in the room, displaying different news networks reporting on the robot's attack on Metropolis. Corbin has gone across the city destroying anything even related to Superman. The reporters are all seeing this, and they are all left asking the same question. Where is Superman? Act 3 We then cut to the Metropolis docks and into the water. We see at the very bottom of it, Superman lying there, unconscious. We then see a flashback into his childhood with Ma and Pa Kent. It's a preteen Clark walking home from school, and he seems really upset. 
He walks into the house, past his parents' questions at the table, and straight to his room. Both Ma and Pa Kent go to get up, but Pa Kent says he can handle it. He walks over to Clark's room and creaks the door open, asking if he can come in. Clark agrees, and Pa Kent sits down on the bed beside his son. He asks what's wrong, and Clark explains that he failed a test at school, and he just doesn't want to do school anymore. He wants to give up. In response, Pa Kent tells him a story of a time he gave up on something when he was younger, even though he knew he could have done it. He explains that we can never give up, because we are capable of so much more than we think. He touches his son's shoulder and says, You're much stronger than you think. Trust me. They hug, and we go back to Clark in the water, as his eyes open. We then cut to Lois and Jimmy as the robot rampages outside. They're in the Daily Planet with the rest of the staff, and they're trying to figure out how to stop the destruction without Superman's help. A lot of people bring up ideas like trying to find where Superman went or calling the military. They're also wondering where Clark Kent is and they hope he's okay. Suddenly, the robot bursts into the building and says he's looking for Lois Lane. He threatens the whole crowd until Lois comes out. Metallo looks at her and asks for an exclusive interview. They get a televised interview running where the robot proclaims that he's killed Superman and that they shouldn't just call him a robot. His name is Metallo. Oh my gosh, finally. I can actually say his name now. (laughs) Across Metropolis, we see citizens watch the broadcast in fear. Except for one. Of course, Lex Luthor, who is laughing, glad that his plan is going well, when suddenly, a shape flies quickly past his window, startling him. We see it fly across the city as people look up. Is that a bird? No, I, I think it's a plane. The shape stops in front of the window of the Daily Planet. Looking in on the broadcast, Jimmy freezes and says quietly, It's Superman. Yeah, it's kind of cheesy, but I like it. Anyway, Superman floats through the broken window and starts to talk to Metallo. I'm not dead yet, Metallo, and I won't be anytime soon. I got rid of you once, I'll get rid of you again. Metallo charges towards Superman and tackles him out the window. They have a small fight flying towards the ground, where Superman tries to keep his distance from Metallo and save some people. They land on the ground and continue to fight, and Superman starts off doing well, landing punches despite the kryptonite weakening him. Metallo gains the upper hand, however, when he uses Superman's other weakness, and starts to specifically target other people, and uses it as a distraction during the fight. By this time, Lois, Jimmy, and the staff of the Daily Planet get to the ground floor to see the fight. Lois yells out to Clark that Metallo is John Corbin, and he's at first really confused, but then realizes that there is a man in there somewhere. He tries to talk to Corbin and tries to calm him down from creating more destruction, but all Corbin cares about is the spotlight, and right now, Superman is getting it, so he continues to fight. Metallo again fully opens his chest, exposing the kryptonite, weakening Superman even more, and he punches him away through a couple of buildings. Superman lies on the ground, beaten, but he's not staying down. He looks around to see the people looking at Superman, begging him to keep fighting, and he thinks back to Pa Kent, Reagan, and he gets back up, because Clark Kent never gives up. He flies back to Metallo and tackles him through the air, punching him across the sky. Metallo eventually brings them both down into a construction site in Metropolis, where there aren't any workers, luckily. They continue to brawl when eventually Superman figures out that while also being a weapon, the kryptonite is also Corbin's power source. The fight continues and Superman still tries to reason with Corbin, but he refuses. If I kill you, he told me I'd get my body back. Superman takes in this information, but the fight continues. Eventually, Metallo has Superman on the ropes and is just beating him senseless. Metallo reveals his kryptonite again to weaken Superman enough to actually kill him, and hold Superman off the edge of the building. Metallo then picks up a piece of rebar with his other hand, and readies to stab Superman in the heart with it, but is interrupted by Superman saying, I'm sorry. As Metallo thrusts the bar forward towards Superman's chest, Superman grabs Metallo and throws them both off the edge of the building. They separate in midair and Metallo loses hold of the bar. 
Superman pushes away from Metallo and grabs the bar in midair, throwing it into his open kryptonite heart and leaving him to fall into a pit of wet concrete. I don't know, maybe that's what the construction workers were working on before they ran. After this, the police arrive and start to try to contain Metallo. Superman also helps to fix what he destroyed on the construction site as the workers return. We then transition to footage of this on TV being watched by Lex Luthor hours later in the early hours of the night. He is obviously angry as he is storming around his office when a shadow appears over him. He looks to see, floating outside his window, Superman, staring at him with his arms crossed. Lex makes a supervillain speech of how he can never be stopped because of his status and money, but Superman says nothing and just floats there. Lex starts to get angry at him and throws something at him, but Superman catches it and crushes it in his hands. As he readies to fly away, he says, If you try anything, know I'll always be there to stop you. Lex tries yelling at him even more, but he's already gone. Before I move on, I should mention that this whole interaction is taken from Season 1, Episode 3 of Superman the Animated Series. It works really well there, and I think it would translate well to this movie, too. Anyway, we follow Clark as he flies through Metropolis with a smile on his face. He then lands down into a back alley as we see him exit the other side of it dressed in normal clothes. He walks into an apartment building and checks the board out front for a name, and he buzzes up. We don't see who it is, though. He gets to the door and knocks when Lois Lane answers it. We see that they both have an important question to ask each other. Lois seems very driven and more serious, well, Clark is pretty nervous, sort of dancing around it for a bit before Lois finally asks him, Are you Superman? Clark is stunned and stumbles over his words and tries to deny it, but Lois is really sure. So Clark folds and explains to her everything. What he is, why he does it, how he did it. Lois isn't mad or anything, though. She understands why he kept it from her and really anyone, because he is still a guy before he is Superman. They talk about that for a while, when Lois remembers that Clark had a question, too. He tries to get out of it, but Lois pressures him into asking it. He gives in and asks her to go out with him. He's a little embarrassed and kind of apologetic at first, but she agrees, and he is ecstatic. They agree on a time and a place, and he goes to leave, but before he does, Lois stops him. Since I know you're Superman, could you fly me around? Clark hasn't really tried it before, so he's a little unsure, but he looks at her and smiles. We then cut to Superman flying across Metropolis with Lois in his arms, as civilians look up in awe. Before going even further into the air, the pair look at each other and smile. There is also a post credit scene in the movie, with a Kryptonian pod landing on Earth, with the symbol of the House of El on its front. Before we get into the story, here's just a couple of details. The title for this film or project would be called Batman Hooded Injustice. And the castings for the characters in this film would be Richard Madden as Batman, Timothy Chalamet as Nightwing, Zoe Dutch as Batgirl, Ralph Fiennes as Alfred Pennyworth, Clancy Brown as Jim Gordon, and Toby Jones as Penguin. There would also be two features from characters in Mad Hatter who would be played by Harry Melling and the Joker who would be played by Iwan Rion. The film starts with a black and white scene where Bruce Wayne walks towards a boy who's crying. Curled up with his head against his knees and sobbing uncontrollably, Bruce sits next to the boy and places his suit jacket around the boy's shoulders. Oddly enough, that one moment of affection from a stranger calmed him down. Bruce says to this boy that something similar happened to him when he was his age. Everything seems lost now, but things will get better. The only color that comes from this scene is the boy's eyes, which are blue. As the camera pans out, Bruce and this boy are sitting in the middle of a carnival, set up underneath a massive tent. This boy was Dick Grayson. Fast forward many years later, Batman and Batgirl are entering a very old house on the outskirts of 
Gotham. The outside looks dungy and abandoned, but as they enter, it's been decorated, very specifically. The house is made to look like the world of Alice in Wonderland. As they make their way through this haunted house of Wonderland, the Mad Hatter continuously calls out for Alice whom he hopes his future Alice to be Batgirl. Every corridor and every hall, there are henchmen waiting for them. Every henchman is wearing a brainwashing hat or mask. Kill the bat and subdue the girl, that's the plan. Of course, this plan doesn't work out in the Hatter's favor, for he is forever to remain without a true Alice. However, Batman notices something very strange during the battle, something that surprised him and threw him off. One of the Hatter's brainwashed men was wearing a scuffed up Red Hood mask. As Gordon is called in to set up a crime scene around the house and arrest the men, some going to Arkham and some going to Blackgate, Batman receives the identity of the man who was wearing the Red Hood mask. Anthony Bressy, a low-level mob boss who tried to make a name for himself in the city, but never made it past one year. He was tied to the death of Dick Grayson's parents, but he wasn't the trigger man, so he never did any hard time. But even now, as a low-level thug, Batman was intrigued. Not much about him, but more about the mask. Mask. Batman and Gordon discuss the Red Hood mask about how they haven't been seen in years and the fact that Batman is suspicious. Batman tells Batgirl to stay and assist with the arrest while he disappears to learn more information. Entering Anthony Bressy's name into his Batmobile computer and accessing his satellite databases, he finds his current address in hopes to discover something of value. Batman isn't sure what he's looking for, but he knows something something is off. Arriving at and searching Anthony's disgusting and run-down apartment, Batman finds a note in the space between the kitchen counter and the fridge. A note that has been previously wet and left on the floor to dry. Some of the words have been smudged by the liquid, and even some of the note has been ripped so some words are missing. The letter says, meet at the F.A., then underneath it, W.A.R., and then underneath that, 2 a.m. signed TZ. Returning to the Batcave, Batman throws the note through the computer's analyzer. The computer will be able to identify the writing that has been smudged and ruined from previous wet substances and what the full note would have said if it wasn't ripped. When walking towards the computer, Dick Grayson stands around eating a bowl of food mouthful and asking Bruce how the night has been. It's only 1.30 in the morning, you're back pretty early, Dick says. Bruce ignores Dick. Bruce and Dick aren't on the best of terms at the moment as Dick is moving out to go to university in Bloodhaven for policing. Becoming a detective has been a passion of his over the years. Bruce feels betrayed as he believes he taught Dick to understand that they are on the right side of justice and due process. If your name isn't Jim Gordon, there is a good chance police work means nothing, or you can't be trusted. To try and create conversation, Dick even tries to tell Bruce about this new suit that he plans on wearing out in the field. A new suit that's going to upgrade him from the Robin suit. And Bruce is having none of it. He is completely disinterested. As Bruce continues to ignore Dick or give him one-word answers, the computer reveals what the note fully said. He deletes the computer's history of what he had analyzed since he wants no one to know what he's looking for. Batman returns to the Batmobile and leaves. And at this point, Dick is getting really frustrated with Bruce, and Alfred realizes that, so you would get a scene where Dick and Alfred would have a discussion about Bruce's behavior. Batman arrives at the location of the note about 20 minutes to 2 a.m. Originally, this note said, meet at the Falcone Warehouse, 2 a.m. signed TZ. This old Falcone warehouse dates back to the 40s, once used to receive shipments of metal and lumber. This warehouse hasn't been used in generations and would be a very convenient spot to hide a mystery. As Batman enters the warehouse, he sees upwards of 300 to 400 people inside wearing Red Hood masks. One man stands amongst them and gives a speech. A speech about how the Red Hood gang has been gone a long time, but returns when needed. 
Batman knows there's a lot more than meets the eye. The Red Hood gang was a prestigious gang who took jobs for other crime bosses to do their dirty work. Dirty work that can't be pinned to anyone as their identity is completely concealed. Moving forward from this discovery, the Red Hood gang leaves the warehouse and begins an assault on Gotham City, trashing small businesses, robbing banks, and causing any other kind of criminal activity possible. Batman of course leaps into action and does what he can on his own, and even though he didn't ask for their help, Batgirl and Robin show up for assistance. Batman eventually leaves the fight against the Red Hoods to Robin and Batgirl so that he can continue his investigation. Robin knows there is something going on that Batman isn't telling him, and he wants to find out what it is. With Gordon leading a vast amount of police against the Red Hoods in the city and Batgirl assisting, Batman goes to Arkham Asylum, which is now on high alert, with strict defense systems just in case the Red Hood gang decides to attack the facility. Batman's visit to Arkham is to have a discussion with the one man he knows had affiliations with the Red Hood gang, considering the day Batman first met the Joker, it was a Red Hood mask he was wearing when he fell into the chemical vat at Ace Chemicals. Hoping to get information that could shed more light on what is happening, Batman sits in an interrogation room with the Joker where the conversation is met with answers hidden behind multiple layers of confusion. Throughout the conversation, Joker essentially tells Batman to train his focus on the Penguin. That is where his answers will be received. Batman Batman tracks his villains at all times through all manners of espionage, so he requests Alfred to give him details on what Penguin has done all night while the city has been attacked by the Red Hood gang. Alfred gives Batman four locations he's been to in the span of 30 minutes. Every location he enters, however, he seems to be accompanied by a Red Hooded bodyguard. As Batman runs off to solve this case, Robin spies on Batman and follows him. Batman races to these locations to find that all of these places were homes of either ex-politicians within Gotham, dirty ex-cops, or criminals who once held a certain level of authority within certain mob gangs. At all four of these locations, all four people have been killed within the span of 30 minutes. These are not people Batman would shed any tears for, but he needs to know what Penguin's game is. Batman uses his augmented reality detective mode to analyze the death scenes of these people, noticing that Penguin wasn't alone when killing his targets. Doing his detective work, he also finds that many of these people have had many run-ins with Penguin before and knew much about his business at the time of their friendships. After enough information at each location, Batman finally figures out the situation at hand. Penguin has been one of the last mobsters in Gotham that has survived with his businesses since Batman has entered the picture. Every year it gets worse. More good cops are entering Gotham's GCPD, better politicians who believe in a fair judicial system, aka Harvey Dent, and Batman becoming harder to fend off and avoid. With Batman running the mob out of Gotham, Penguin fears that he will be next. So because of that, Penguin chooses to tie up loose ends. Loose ends who potentially have even looser tongues. And the Red Hood Gang? simply used as a distraction. Penguin used the Red Hood gang in hopes that Gotham would be trained on that while he can go out and kill somewhat important people without being noticed. He certainly underestimates Batman. After learning all this information, Batman wants to try one more thing. In one of the murder victims' homes he's in right now, Batman grabs a nearby laptop which captured audio playback, since all audio devices capture sound whether it's recording or not. As he hacks into its audio system, the owner of this house opens the door and is greeted by a man. Almost sounding happy but nervous to see this person, the homeowner says, Tony Zuko? To what do I owe the pleasure of a 3 a.m. visit? The TZ initials on the note that Batman found in Anthony Bressy's apartment makes much more sense now, but wasn't overly shocking to Batman at the same time. As the audio continues, 
Tony tells the person he has someone who wishes to speak with him, which ends up being Penguin walking in, and the rest is history. Robin, who has been spying on Batman's progress, can't help his surprise and his anger, and he yells out, Tony Zuko? Batman wasn't surprised that Robin was following him, but Robin insists on Batman telling him, everything that's going on. Tony Zuko is of course the known murderer of Dick Grayson's parents, but he's been off the radar for nearly 10 years. And now that it's confirmed that Tony Zuko has been working with the Penguin, one has to wonder if Penguin had something to do with the Grayson's death. Batman calmly and sternly explains the situation in a few sentences, but tells Robin he doesn't want him around when confronting Penguin because he doesn't want Robin to react in a rash way, nor does he want him doing something he may regret to towards his parents' killer. With Robin's temper flaring and the fact they haven't been on good standings lately, he leaves and decides to track down Penguin and Zuko on his own. Batman knows he can no longer control Robin. He watches him from afar and analyzes Robin's actions for his plan of attack. Robin enters the Iceberg Lounge through a sewage system and makes his way to Tony Zuko through stealth. Batman decides to go in loud and move through all the henchmen that Penguin has guarding his club. Batman eventually reaches Penguin and starts throwing him around and beating him mercilessly. Recording him at the same time in the anticipation he will admit to the crimes of the four murders and the planned attack on Gotham from the Red Hood gang, which he does do. Penguin tries to make his case sound better by saying that after me there will be others that continue to do what I had to do. Batman doesn't care or listen, and after knocking Penguin out cold and tying him up for the police, he must get to Robin before he potentially goes too far with Zuko. But before leaving Penguin's office, Batman decides to take a quick look around. Batman finds an old photo that we can't see, but was interesting enough to take with him. Robin, on the other hand, has encountered Zuko, and after a brief conversation with a Robin who's only seeing red, by the time Batman gets there, Zuko looks nearly unrecognizable. His face bloody and swelling up from how brutal Robin's punches are. In his very stoic manner, Batman tries to center Robin and tells him not to go down this road. Robin knows he's right and stops, but he turns to Batman and tells him, I'm done. He walks away from Batman, and hours later, we see him with his stuff packed away in a car, as he drives away from Wayne Manor. Bruce looks out of one of his mansion windows as Dick drives away. After what seems to be a few seconds of sadness, he turns and walks away from the window, as father and son have now gone their separate ways. Bruce returns to the Batcave to get ready for another night. While preparing, Alfred has a conversation with Bruce about opening up and talking about how this is making him feel, in which Bruce moves past it and basically says it no longer matters, Dick has gone his way, and his life is for him to lead. And during that line that Bruce has about Dick leading his own life, you would get another black and white scene of Dick, now in his new apartment in Bloodhaven, sitting at his workbench. The only color in that scene is once again his eyes, in which his suit also happens to be blue as well, as he sits there and creates the new symbol for his suit the Nightwing symbol. Bruce then opens an image on the Bat computer and tells Alfred, this is what matters. It's the photo Batman found in Penguin's office. It's a photo taken maybe 30 years ago. In this picture is a younger Oswald Cobblepot, Carmine Falcone, Sal Maroney, an unidentified man holding a red hood mask, Bruce Wayne's grandfather, and another unidentified man holding an owl mask, by his waist. Bruce looks intensely at his computer, determined to know what his grandfather is doing in the photo and the mystery of the owl mask. 
As for an end credit scene, this film would feature one. Returning from patrol one night with Batgirl, the computer gets a satellite ping. Alfred opens the satellite imagery, and it shows Superman and Wonder Woman shaking hands. Batman tracks these heroes and has a huge meta-human database with the goal to learn more about these people, what their abilities are, and how dangerous they could potentially be to the human race. Batman takes off his cowl and has a suspicious look on his face, in which he tells Alfred to add it to the metahuman files. This movie is called Green Lantern, Heart of Stone. And first, I need to mention that all the credit for this story and idea goes to some kid. Unfortunately, things didn't end up super well, but he still deserves all the credit for the idea. So go check out his channel in the description and all the channels that are in this project as well. I should also mention that this is formatted very differently than my last pitch. So don't really expect a deep dive into the plot, but here we go. The movie stars Hal Jordan and Jon Stewart, being played by Alden Ehrenreich and Aldous Hodge. They've been newly paired up and Jon is newer to the Green Lantern Corps as a whole. They've been placed under the leadership of Kilowog and Sinestro, who debrief them on a series of murders of Green Lantern Corps members happening around the galaxy. Now, the main thing I want to highlight in this movie is the banter between the two leads and the relationship between Hal and Jon. If I had to compare this to a movie, it would be like Lethal Weapon mixed with Star Wars, a buddy cop movie set in space. Another theme of this movie and the Green Lantern trilogy as a whole is emotion, and specifically for this movie, the center of the Green Lantern Corps, willpower. Both Hal and John have very specific characteristics too. Hal has been a Green Lantern for longer as John is much newer, but John is much more professional while Hal is more immature thinking that he has it all together. John throughout this movie does not have an arc. He has a flat arc, meaning he doesn't change across the movie. Hal, however, does have an arc of learning to love his job again. He's become bored with being a Green Lantern, but John, a newcomer, reminds him of what he's doing, saving people across the galaxy. Maybe we can see at the beginning of the movie that his ring is a little bit weaker as he's losing that willpower, but he regains it over time as he regains the will to be a Green Lantern. Other characters that are focused on are Kilowog, played by Ving Rhames, and Sinestro, played by Luke Evans. They're acting as the kind of police chiefs to Hal and John. It would kind of be the classic, like, you have 48 hours to finish the case or you're off the force, but in space. In all seriousness though, we would get scenes with Kilowog and Sinestro throughout the movie, just seeing what they're doing while Hal and John are on their investigation. Because this is a superhero movie though, they get into a space bar fight, cause we need some action. They're just trying to look for a witness, but everything goes awry, tables are thrown, space beer is thrown, punches are thrown, everything is thrown. Eventually, the pair reach the witness, and he points them towards a group of space pirates that took the murder weapon after the murderer dropped it. So they chase after the pirate ship with the help of another Green Lantern, Tomar Ray, played by Simon Pegg. The three of them together chase after the ship, with Jon Stewart and Tomar Ray getting onto it, while Hal Jordan is close behind in a construct fighter jet. I think this could be a super cool fight scene, and just would be amazing. Eventually, Hal and John catch on to where the killer is and chase him to a small planet where a firefight breaks out. During the fight, however, more aliens that look like the killer appear, and Hal and John are just barely able to hold them off while also saving as many people, though there are casualties. Eventually, the killer and its associates leave, and Hal and John try to help as many people as they can before reporting back to Oa with what they've found. They bring it up to the Guardians of the Universe, who are like the presidents of the Green Lantern Corps, basically. And they show them footage from the rings of what happened, and the Guardians realize who it is. The Manhunters. The Guardians then explain that the Manhunters were a police force that they had created and were the predecessors to the Green Lanterns. They eventually went rogue though and started killing wildly, so the Guardians got rid of as many of them as they could, and buried them. But they didn't get everyone, including their leader, High Master. 
Hal, and especially John, are furious that they wouldn't share this information with them, but the Guardians are unbothered. They explain that they've been made to kill, so the Green Lantern Corps has to kill them. The Guardians enable lethal force on the Green Lantern rings, and tells them all to go after the Manhunters, find them, and kill them. John is not having it though. He believes that the Manhunters, though they were made to kill, don't have to kill. And one thing about John is that when he has a belief, he will stand by it and not change it for anyone. The Guardians create a task force to kill the Manhunters, comprised of John, Hal, and many other Lanterns. But John convinces the rest of the group before they land at the Manhunters base to not kill the Manhunters. When they land on the base, it is a battle for the ages. It's the Green Lanterns versus the Manhunters, and in the end, there's only three people left standing. Hal and John versus Highmaster. They all fight for a bit, but eventually John is taken out, leaving just a weakened Hal against the mighty Highmaster. Hal stands alone, but he looks to John and remembers everything he's taught him across the movie. And he recites, well, I'll just let him say it. In brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power. Green Lantern's light! Hal uses his newfound power and strikes down High Master, but he does not kill him. He says that you were made to kill, but that doesn't mean you have to. He asks him truly if that's what he wants to do, and High Master says no. His will shouldn't go towards killing others, and neither should anyone else's. He decides to turn himself and the other Manhunters in for what they've done, and Hal promises he'll take care of them. Pretty much after this, the Manhunters go to prison, all the Green Lanterns get patched up, Hal and John talk to Kilowog and Sinestro, and Sinestro expresses that he thinks they should have killed the Manhunters. Hal and John also talk to the Guardians about what happened, with only one, Ganthet, actually thinking they did a good thing. And the movie ends with a conversation between Hal and John, and just what they think of each other now at the end of the movie, as they head off onto their next mission. There is also a post credit scene for the movie, where an alien from the firefight earlier mourns the death of his family that died as a part of the attack, as a red energy starts to consume him and mysteriously change him into something. The movie opens inside a classroom in Central City University. Inside the classroom, we find Wally West, played by Jack Quaid, listening to a Communications 101 lecture he is taking for a general education requirement. Wally is 25 and getting his second degree. His first one was in physics, and this one is in biochemical engineering. Sitting on either side of Wally are his friends from the Central City Police Department, Manuel Lago, played by Darren Chris, and Patty Spivett played by Annalisa Cochran, both who are also in Communications 101 for a general education requirement, which they both believe is ridiculous since they are both studying criminal justice and what the heck does communications have to do with the criminal justice system anyways. Sitting just behind Wally is Connie Nolesky, played by Dakota Fanning. In a similar situation to the three, she is an up-and-coming fashion model who is studying graphic design but is forced to take COM 101 to complete one of her general education requirements. Wally thinks she's cute, but he's too afraid to talk to her. The class is taught by communications graduate student Linda Park, played by Jessica Henwick, who Wally also thinks is cute, but finds the lecture so boring, he can't stand the thought of having to listen to her talk about communications in the news all day, especially since she will be working for Picture News after she graduates this year. Something Wally is very familiar with thanks to his Aunt Iris working there as their headline reporter. As class ends, Patty tells Wally that he better not be late today or Captain Fry will have his head. Wally rolls his eyes, but as he stands up to leave, Linda calls him over. Linda tells Wally that she is super impressed by Wally's essay about his hero, The Flash. Wally smiles and starts talking about all of his favorite stories that he heard about The Flash such as on February 11, 1988, when The Flash first appeared and defeated Captain Cold when he attempted to freeze Central City. 
March 10th, 1990, when Flash stopped Captain Boomerang from robbing Central City Bank. December 5th, 1995, when Gorilla Grodd attempted to mind control the entirety of Central City before the Flash crafted a neurological implant to suppress his mind control capabilities. Or September 15th, 2000, when the Flash stopped a new villain group called the Rogues, headed by Captain Cold and the Trickster, from blowing up the Central City Capitol building. Wally's personal favorite memory, however, is when his Aunt Iris took him to see the opening of the Flash Museum on February 11th, 2005, when young Wally got to see the Flash in person as the mayor of Central City declared February 11th Flash Appreciation Day, commemorating the years of dedication and service the Flash gave to the citizens of Central City. Wally says that while he loves the Flash, and he certainly made Central City a much safer place, he said the Flash has not been seen since 2018. Linda chuckles and tells Wally that she can tell he really loves the Flash and really appreciated all the research he conducted for their latest research assignment. Wally smiles, but as he looks down at his watch, he realizes that he is going to be late for his internship once again. He apologizes to Linda and quickly runs off. He watches Wally runs inside the Central City Police Department as you see him pass the crime lab. He stealthily attempts to sneak into the engineering wing. As he does, we hear a man scream, West! Wally turns around as we see Captain Daryl Fry, played by Ed Harris, who scolds Wally for once again being late. Fry tells Wally that his uncle used to also have issues getting to work on time, but that Wally is still just a lowly intern, and he was given this internship in part thanks to his uncle's strong recommendation. Wally sighs as Fry tells Wally to head home. He will be coming back later in the night to work the evening shift, and that he should not be late. We watch as Wally walks home to the household of Barry Allen and Iris West. Wally has been living with his aunt and uncle since he was a teenager following the tragic death of his parents. As Wally walks inside, we are greeted by Barry Allen, played by Rob Lowe, a retired member of the Central City Police Department known as one of the best crime scene detectives in all of Central City, and Iris West, played by Jennifer Garner, the head primetime reporter for Picture News. Barry asks Wally about his day. As Wally explains to Barry about him arriving late once again, Iris begins to scold Wally as Barry intervenes and reminds her that he was also not always the most consistent when it came to arriving places on time. Barry reminds Wally of the importance of his job, while Iris mentions that she finally met Linda today. Linda is going to be taking over for Iris as a primetime reporter at Picture News after she retires later in the month. Wally smiles as he heads to his room, he throws his backpack down, plops on his bed, and sighs as we see his room is filled with posters and action figures of The Flash. Cut to later that night in the engineering wing of the Central City Police Department. We find that Wally is sitting in a chair watching the perils of Penelope Pit Stop on his phone as Captain Fry walks into the room and asks Wally what he's doing. Wally explains that he managed to complete the required repairs to police equipment in less than an hour. Fry goes and tests out the equipment, and much to his surprise, every repair had been fully completed in less than an hour, and everything is working properly. Fry tells Wally good work, but his night isn't over. There's a storm coming, and the chemicals and lab equipment kept in the crime lab need to be transferred to the storage room in case the storm gets bad enough. Fry tells Wally that he's headed out, but to have a good night, and that he's free to leave as soon as he completes the transport of this equipment. While he puts down his phone, sighs, and heads to the crime lab to begin moving the items to the storage room. We watch as Wally is packing up items such as beakers and tongs. Outside, we see that there is lightning as we hear thunder crack right outside the window. While he quickly runs to put the beakers and tongs in the storage closet as he returns to move the chemicals. Suddenly, lightning breaks through the window of the lab, striking Wally and drenching him with the chemicals being contained in the beakers that he was attempting to transport. We watch as Wally lies on the ground. He attempts to garner enough strength to stand after the lightning strike, and as he does, he tells himself that he should be dead. There's no way that he could be hit with lightning and drenched in chemicals and still survive. Wally eventually manages to stand up fully and finds that, to his surprise, he feels completely fine, and his body suffered no burns, cuts, or bruises from the strike, although his head does hurt a bit. Wally decides that he needs to sweep up the broken glass from the beakers, and as he begins to walk to grab the broom, 
He moves so quickly that he face plants into the wall. Despite the impact, his nose isn't bleeding or broken, and once again, he didn't suffer any other physical injuries as a result. Wally looks at the broom and has an idea. He's going to attempt to sweep up and move around the remaining equipment into the storage closet as fast as he can. Wally begins running around the room, cleaning up the broken glass and moving the items into the storage closet in a matter of seconds. Wally screams in excitement as he finishes moving the items, but quickly notices that his clothes are on fire as a fire alarm inside the lab begins flashing and the sprinkler system activates and drenches Wally. Wally quickly changes into a crime lab uniform and decides to head home and tell Barry and Iris that he thinks he's gained the powers of his hero, the Flash. We watch as Wally returns home around 3 a.m. and shouts for Barry and Iris. We watch as Barry and Iris slowly walk to the living room as Iris scolds Wally for waking them up in the early hours of the morning, and Barry asks why he is wearing a crime lab uniform. Wally tells Iris he is sorry that it's an emergency. Wally then proceeds to explain what happened in the laboratory, how he managed to move so fast that his clothes burned off. Iris and Barry look at each other as Barry goes to close all the blinds and make sure that nobody is standing outside of the house as he proceeds to tell Wally that the same thing happened to him in October 1988. That night, he became the Flash. Wally is in disbelief, and he tells Barry that he doesn't believe him. Barry sighs as in a matter of seconds, he appears in front of Wally wearing the classic Flash costume. Wally's jaw drops as he begins to ask Barry all about fighting some of his most well-known foes. Captain Cold, Captain Boomerang, Trickster... Barry quickly cuts him off and asks him if that's all he remembers the Flash for. Barry explains that there is much more to being the Flash than just the villains. It's about the times that he saved people from burning buildings, or gave orphans toys on Christmas Day. Wally ignores Barry's lecture and asks him why he decided to retire. Barry explains that around 2018, he had the realization that most of the criminals that had given Central City trouble had either given up their evil ways or were serving the remainder of their days in Iron Heights Penitentiary. Along with this, crime had reached an all-time low, and he truly felt that he had done his part to help Central City, and giving up his role as the Flash would allow him to spend more time with Iris. And with all of that being taken into consideration, he decided to hang up the costume. Wally tells Barry that the Flash is his hero, and despite all the improvements made to Central City, the city still needs a hero, someone that kids can look up to and want to model their lives after. And after thinking for a minute, Wally suggests that perhaps he should be the one to assume the title of Flash now that he's been granted these new powers. Iris quickly says no, as she doesn't want Wally being put in danger, while Barry once again reiterates that being the Flash is much more than simply donning a suit, running extremely fast, and fighting bad guys. Despite this, Wally insists that he take over. He's never had something to call his own, and he gained his new abilities for some reason. So why not make that reason to protect the people of Central City and continue the legacy of the Flash? Iris sighs as Barry says that he's going to contact his old team from the crime lab, as they might be able to have some more insight into how they should move forward. Wally smiles as we watch the three head to bed. Cut to the following afternoon as we see Barry sitting in the kitchen with Wally, Kristen Kramer, played by Laura Dern, and James Forrest, played by Keith David. Barry explains to Wally that Kramer and Forrest are his friends from the crime lab who retired with him a few years ago, and that they are some of the only people who know about him being the Flash. Barry further explains that both Kramer and Forrest helped him out when he was active as the Flash. They helped him create his first suit, and made sure he was always eating properly and healing steadily after his missions. Kramer notes that she wasn't a fan of Barry at first, but he slowly grew on her as they started working more and more, while Forrest sighs and says he wishes he could get back to working on his boat. Barry chuckles nervously as he explains the situation to his friends and, and asks them their thoughts on what should be done about Wally. Forrest notes that being the Flash is kind of like driving a boat. You have to be steady watch the waves as they roll, and check the weather frequently. Wally looks at Forrest confused as Kramer tells Wally to ignore him. She mentions that having a new hero protecting the citizens of Central City wouldn't be a bad idea, 
but she isn't capable of providing all the help she used to. Forrest agrees with Kramer and says that the only thing he remembers is how they created the first flash shoot out of reinforced tripolymer and a silica-based quartz sand fabric to prevent the suit from burning up. Forrest and Kramer agree that they could work to make a new suit, but providing Wally with the proper nutrition would be a different story, especially since his body will likely take a bit to adjust to the changes that will come along with his new powers. So we see Barry contemplate what could be done. Kramer pipes up and says that she recently started going to see Dr. Tina McGee, a nutritionist at the newly opened Gene Tech, for dietary advice, and that it might be a good idea to talk to her about helping out Wally. Barry asks Kramer if she 100% trusts McGee, and Kramer nods. Barry looks to Wally and tells him that it appears that they will be making a visit to Gene Tech. Kramer says that she will come with the two, while Forrest mentions that he can start throwing together a new suit for Wally while they are gone. He remembers the process fairly well, so it shouldn't be much of a hassle for him. Barry nods as he looks to Wally and says, Are you ready? And Wally nods. Cut to Gene Tech, where we see Wally, Barry, and Kristen walking with Dr. Tina McGee, played by Ellie Taylor, to her office. On the way, Tina introduces the group to her husband, Dr. Jerry McGee, played by Justin Hartley, the founder of Gene Tech and a specialist in hyperphysiology. Jerry nods at the group and welcomes them to Gene Tech, as Tina continues to lead the group to her office. As the group enters the office, they all take a seat as Tina asks them what exactly they are coming to see her for. Barry explains the situation and that anyone who has access to the abilities that he and Wally have burn calories at an accelerated rate based on the physical toll that moving at super speed takes on their bodies. Not to mention, with super speed comes a super metabolism. Tina chuckles in disbelief as she looks at the group and says that she doesn't believe them. Suddenly, we watch as Wally quickly speeds around the office, knocking over all of Tina's files and throwing her papers everywhere. Wally stops just long enough for Tina to realize what just happened, before quickly cleaning up the mess and returning all the files to their proper place on the shelf. Wally returns to his seat, with his shirt getting burnt off as very quickly begins putting out the flame on his pants leg as Wally asks Tina if she believes him now. Tina sits in shock as she says she can't believe what she just saw. It was the most incredible athletic feat that she has ever seen in her entire life. And she would love to start developing a nutrition plan with Wally. Wally smiles as Tina says that there will be one condition for her help. That being that the Flash will endorse Gene Tech as the best place for nutritional advice and training in exchange for her help and keeping Wally and Barry's identity secret. Wally immediately accepts as Barry looks to Wally and mentions that he does not know how he feels about Wally using the Flash title for promotional purposes. Wally reassures him that while Barry was always super heroic as the Flash, his marketing skills were always a bit subpar. Kristen gets a phone call and tells the group that Forrest completed the new suit and they should go check it out. Tina hands Wally a Gene Tech t-shirt and says that she is looking forward to their new partnership as the group exits her office. We cut back to the Allen household as we see Wally, Barry, and Kristen looking at Forrest who is standing in the living room holding a dark crimson flash suit. Wally walks up and takes the suit and begins to smile as he stares down at the flash symbol in the middle of the chest. Wally looks to Barry and tells him how much of an honor it is to take up the mantle from his hero. Barry tells Wally to put on the suit. He needs to take him somewhere before they begin discussing his training. We cut to Iron Heights Penitentiary where we see Barry and Wally both wearing their Flash costumes as Barry introduces Wally to Gregory Wolf, played by Ernie Hudson, the warden of Iron Heights Penitentiary, who lets the two walk around the maximum security prison. Wally comments that he never understood why Barry never gave his villains cool nicknames, like Magilla the mind-controlling gorilla, or Gargamel, or something like that. Barry turns to Wally and scolds him for making jokes out of the residence of the penitentiary. Barry explains that the villains he fought are not necessarily bad guys because they are bad people, but most of them turn to a life of crime based on the circumstances they found themselves in. As Barry and Wally continue walking around, we cut to a prison cell where inside sits Leonard Snart, aka Captain Cold, played by Bill Hader, who comments that he believes he hears Flash. He's disappointed that it has been five years since the Flash last visited him, and he can't believe he forgot about him. In the cell next to Snart, we find Gorilla Grodd, voiced by Sir Patrick Stewart, 
who comments that Flash is the same as all the other humans, fickle creatures who attempt to attain moral superiority but falter when things get difficult. Grodd explains that he has been reading Machiavelli, Socrates, and Kant since he's been locked up, and discover that the human species is flawed in every way. And there's no better example than the prison system. People who need help are sent to prison to rot, instead of being given the proper care and support that they deserve. Snart pipes up and reminds Grodd that Flash used to visit him, and actually made Snart feel like someone cared about him. But now that he's stopped, he's ready to make the Flash regret ever giving up on him. Grodd says that he is willing to help Snart escape and get his revenge against Flash, but in order to do this, Snart will need to remove the neuroblocker that the Flash placed on the back of Grodd's head, which prevented his mind-controlling powers from working. Grodd's plan is to have Snart request his cell to be made colder and colder, gradually right. causing Snart to regain some of his cryokinetic powers he obtained during his time fighting the Flash, which will grant him enough power to break through the prison walls, allowing him to remove the neuroblocker from Grodd and allowing both to escape. The two agree on their plan of escape as we cut back to Barry and Wally, who agree to begin training together. We cut to a montage. First, we see Wally and Barry training. Barry shows Wally how to perform various techniques such as phasing, the proper ability to stop when coming out of super speed, and how to create the flash tornado. We also cut and see Wally using his newfound competence to ask out Connie, who becomes his girlfriend. We watch as they go on several dates, but Wally does not feel a real emotional connection with her as he only asks her out based on her appearance, not because of who she is as a person. We also see Wally using his newfound fame as a Flash to help promote gene tech, appearing in advertisements with Dr. McGee and becoming the official spokesperson and the face of light speed energy bars. While Wally has attempted to promote his status to that of a celebrity figure in Central City, people of Central City have dubbed him Flatu, mostly because the people already had a Flash, and this new Flash is not the same as the original. Wally is frustrated by this, especially after Linda Park appeared on Picture News and gave him this nickname. We also see Snart slowly regaining his powers as he slowly convinces the guards at Iron Heights to keep lowering the temperature in his cell, saying that the heat on the outside is causing his cell to feel more like a furnace. Cut to around three months later, we watch as Snart taps the wall inside his cell and tells Grodd that he thinks he will finally be able to break through the wall. We then watch as Snart quickly winds up and punches his way through the prism wall, the freezing temperature having the effect of both weakening the prism wall structure and increasing Snart's physical strength. We watch as Snart removes the neuroblocker from Grodd's head. As Grodd regains the ability to use mind control, we watch as he controls Warden Wolf and the other officers inside the penitentiary as they open up Grodd and Snart's cell doors, Watch as alarms begin sounding inside the maximum security prison as Grodd commands the guards to recover Snart's cold gun as we see Snart smile. Grodd tells Snart that this is only the beginning and they need to head to the Flash Museum. Grodd will command the guards to begin gathering supplies needed for his plan to fix humanity. We cut inside the Allen household as Wally and Barry are arguing as Iris watches television in the living room. Barry tells Wally that he is extremely disappointed in how he has handled his time as the Flash, choosing to focus on building his image instead of helping those in Central City who need it most. Wally says he is upset that Barry hasn't supported his decision to promote the Flash's brand, and just because he isn't following the exact steps Barry took doesn't mean he is any less of a hero than he was. As the two keep arguing, Iris quickly calls the two into the room to check out the breaking news report from Picture News. The two watch as we see Linda Park reporting on a developing story, that being a prison break that just occurred at Iron Heights Penitentiary. Suddenly, we watch as Captain Cold and Gorilla Grodd walk up to the camera. Cold grabs Park as Grodd begins talking into the microphone, mind controlling the cameraman to ensure that he does not run away and holds the mic up to his mouth. Grodd explains that he used to live in Gorilla City, a thriving city of gorillas located on the African continent. One day, the city was destroyed during a war between two countries of man, years ago, killing all the inhabitants except for Grodd. Grodd discovered one of the soldiers was a man from Central City, which is when he decided to launch his attack in 1995 by mind-controlling the citizens of Central City to attack each other 
and an attempt to destroy and burn down all of the buildings, for the Flash managed to stop him. Grodd apologizes for the attack and says that during his time in prison, he learned the errors of his ways and knows that the war that destroyed his people was merely because of the fundamental flaws of humanity. Grodd explains that humanity took a step backwards in its evolutionary cycle, that humans are willing to lock up their own kind, promote addiction to alcohol and drugs, and kill each other over petty matters. In an attempt to give back to humanity, Grodd announces that he is planning to launch a DNA-modifying gas on Central City that will transform all of the residents into gorillas, the more noble and civilized of the two species, thus righting the wrong of his attack years ago and moving society forward in the process. Grodd says that this change will occur in a little under an hour, so the populace should prepare to have their lives enhanced forever. As Grodd walks away, Cold walks in front of the camera and warns Flash that the two will be operating from the Flash Museum, and that he will be keeping the reporter company until his old pal the Scarlet Speedster arrives. While it tells Barry that they have to hurry, because Linda could be in danger. Barry looks to Iris, who nods and says, It looks like Central City is going to need Flash and Flatou, or everyone will be gorillas in a matter of hours. Cut to the outside of the Flash Museum as we see Captain Cold sitting in front of the statue of Flash as we watch Barry and Wally run in front of Captain Cold, who laughs and greets the Flash. He asks Barry who the new guy is. Barry shrugs and says, You can call him Kid Flash, I guess? Wally rolls his eyes, but comments that it is still better than the name Flatou. As Barry looks to Cold and asks him why he's doing this, Cold screams that the Flash doesn't care about him anymore and never did, as he watched Captain Cold begin to battle Barry and Wally. He watches Cold manages to blast Wally with his cold gun as he and Barry trade blows. We slowly watch as Wally phases out of the ice and begins pummeling Captain Cold. We watch as Wally holds Captain Cold up by his jacket in front of the statue of Flash. He screams at him for almost hurting Linda and prepares to deliver a fatal final blow. For Barry screams and stops Wally. Barry looks at Cold and asks him, Why are you doing this? Cold screams at Barry, telling him that for his entire life, nobody cared about him or what he did. He was a nobody, a loner, until the Flash began coming to check on him in prison weekly, making sure he was getting help, eating properly. Cold says that he felt like at least one person cared about him, until all of a sudden the Flash stopped coming to visit. He once again felt like he was a nobody, and it was proof to him that no one could ever care about him. Barry profusely apologizes to Cold, telling him that he had no idea the weekly meetings meant so much to him, and that he had things come up in his life that made seeing him every week difficult, but that, despite this, he never stopped caring about Cold, and if he ever gave off the wrong impression, he's truly sorry. As Cold and Barry hug, Wally watches on and contemplates what Barry told him about what it means to be the Flash. Wally goes to check on Linda, who tells him that everything is okay, before Barry tells Wally that they are not done. They need to go in and stop Grodd before he manages to turn everyone in Central City into gorillas, as we watch the two speedsters hurry inside. On the inside of the museum, we watch as Wally and Barry sneak around, avoiding being seen by the Iron Heights guards and museum staff that are under Grodd's mind control, and are guarding and patrolling the area. Watch as Wally and Barry manage to sneak onto the roof where we find Grodd putting the finishing touches on the DNA modifier. Grodd notices the two and tells Flash that it has been a while, but he will not allow Flash to once again foil his plans, and that in response to this, he will seek to find out who of the two Flashes is better. He watches Grodd begins mind controlling Barry, who begins a brief fight with Wally. Wally manages to use his intellect to recall that Barry used a neuroblocker to stop Grodd. He watches Wally race his Barry through the museum as Wally gathers the necessary materials and puts them together to form his own version of the neuroblocker. We watch as he races back onto the roof and he punches the machine on the back of Grodd's head, releasing Barry, the Iron Heights guards, and the museum staff of his mind control. We then watch as Wally and Barry team up to beat Grodd knocking him out through their combined strength. 
and we watch as the two attempt to find a way to turn off the machine. Barry looks to Wally and exclaims that they only have 30 seconds before the machine is activated, and from the looks of it, Grodd designed it to be foolproof. There's no way they can turn it off. As Barry begins contemplating if he could use the speed force to fix the mess, we watch as Cold runs onto the roof and uses his cold gun to freeze the top part of the machine where the gas would be released. Barry looks to Cold and tells him that even if he manages to prevent the gas from being released, the machine will explode and possibly kill everyone in the building. Cold screams that he knows the consequences, but tells Flash and Kid Flash to rescue the people inside. Cold might be a bad guy, but he doesn't allow innocent people to die on his watch if possible. We then watch as Cold continues freezing the top of the device as Wally and Barry race to get all the people out of the building. We watch as Wally and Barry stand on the outside of the museum with all the people from the inside as we cut back to Cold continuing to freeze the machine as suddenly it explodes. The force of the explosion sends a shockwave around Central City. Miraculously, as the dust clears, the Flash Museum did not crumble due to the energy released by the explosion. But as Barry and Wally rush to the top of the museum, we find the lifeless body of Leonard Snart, who managed to prevent the gas from being released on Central City, but died in the process. Barry kneels as Wally looks on, realizing that Barry was right. Just because Captain Cold had done bad things, it didn't mean that he was truly a bad person deep down. He was a victim of circumstance, but a victim who died a hero. Cut to three weeks later, at the funeral of Leonard Snart, we see the entire staff of Iron Heights Penitentiary and the Central City Police Department, including Wally West, Iris West, Daryl Fry, Patty Spivett, Manuel Lago, Kristen Kramer, James Forrest, and Gregory Wolf. We watch as retired crime scene analyst Barry Allen delivers a eulogy for Snart, commenting about how he worked with Snart on a few occasions during his crime scene investigations, and while he did not always do the right thing, he was a misunderstood man who flipped the script and died a hero. After the funeral, we watch as Linda Park walks up to Wally outside and comments about how nice it was for Barry to pay for all the funeral expenses for Snart. Wally smiles and says that his uncle is a good man and that he's just doing whatever it takes to make sure that a citizen of Central City is taken care of. Linda asks Wally about how things are going with Connie. Wally chuckles and says that there have been some major changes in his life. He broke up with Connie because he didn't feel anything special with her and also decided to change his academic path from getting a second degree in biochemical engineering to a criminal justice degree. He intends to move to the Central City Crime Lab like his uncle before him. Linda smiles and said she is happy to hear about everything going on in Wally's life, but would also love to hear Wally's thoughts on Flatou. Since he was such a big fan of the original Flash, she wants his thoughts on Central City's newest hero. Wally smiles and asks Linda if she wants to go grab lunch and he'd be happy to discuss. Linda smiles and agrees as we watch the two walk away as the film ends. Following the credits, we see a figure standing at the gravestone of Leonard Snart. The camera pans, and we see that a woman is standing there. She is revealed to be Lisa Snart, played by Rachel McAdams, who says, I can't believe it. Flash killed my brother. Perhaps the Flash deserves to get put in his place once again. Maybe I should see about getting the gang back together. The movie opens with some exposition. Getting out of the way early, we hear Hippolyta narrate the history of an ancient Amazonian artifact known as the Spear of Destiny. There was a great war amongst the Amazons and Atlanteans thousands of years ago over who would take control of the relic. After a witch named Circe found a way to harness its power before the Amazons or Atlanteans just decimated them. The two warring kingdoms came together to defeat Circe and banish her to Tartarus, which is like the Greek underworld, where her soul remains locked away, only able to be freed by the spear itself. After both sides realized that nobody could 
should be trusted with this kind of power. They hid the artifact where nobody would ever be able to find it. We then see Hippolyta talking to a young Diana, this being one of Diana's favorite bedtime stories. We got to 1944 in Normandy, France. The Axis powers are digging out bunkers on the beach. As they do this, they find a strange object in the dirt. They dig it out and the item is revealed. It's the Spear of Destiny. As they pull it out, the spear begins glowing and suddenly we see a dark, fiery landscape. A dark figure hangs from chains suspended over hot coal. The figure's eyes shoot open, burning an orange flame that engulf the pupils. And that's the opening of the movie. It gets all of the necessary exposition out of the way right at the start, it establishes our setting, shows us the tone of the movie, and we even get our first introduction to the MacGuffin as well as our villain. The plot of this movie revolves around Wonder Woman learning of the Spear of Destiny's recovery and Cersei leaving Tartarus in order to untether her soul. While Cersei's physical body can leave Tartarus, her soul is forever trapped there. The rest of Act 1 shows an older Diana in the Mascara with the Amazons discussing the resurfacing of the spear. Hippolyta, Diana, and the rest of the leaders discuss their plan of action. Diana tells them that she should be the one to retrieve it. When Hippolyta asks why, Diana tells her that she's the only one with a connection to the rest of the world. This connection is Steve Trevor, working for the Office of Strategic Services. If you don't know what the OSS is, they were a group of people within the US government during World War II that planned espionage missions behind enemy lines. Hippolyta and the rest of the Amazons agree that Diana should go. Her mission is to find the spear and bring it back to the Mascara. Shortly after this, we see Diana arrive at Navy Hill, which was the operation base of the OSS. It's not far from Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. When she arrives, she meets with Steve Trevor. The two talk about the spear, and Diana catches him up to speed on what its capabilities are. If it fell into the wrong hands, it could be used to win the war with ease. Steve tells Diana that he's aware of what it can do. When Diana asks how he knows this, he introduces her to a team that they were getting prepared to send. We meet the Justice Society of America. The team includes Dr. Fate, The Flash, Green Lantern, Liberty Bell, and Damage. Steve tells Diana that Kent Nelson has been supplying the U.S. government with information on the spear. After Diana introduces herself to the team, this is where we get our main introductions to the members of the JSA. Dr. Fate is an incredibly powerful magic user with control over the Helmet of Fate. Jay Garrick, also known as The Flash, is a man who can run at the speed of sound. Alan Scott, the first Green Lantern, has control over a ring given power by a cosmic being known as Starheart. Liberty Bell is a strategist with enhanced strength, durability, speed, and endurance. And the final member, Damage, is the youngest member of the group. His powers are unique. He has incredible durability and slowed aging, but his main ability is that as he takes damage, he gains power, and he's able to take the energy that he's stored after taking damage and release them into powerful energy blasts. Think of like Black Panther's suit. And that's the end of Act 1. Okay, I know that that was a lot to take in, but it was necessary. We have our team in place, they have their mission, and we know that Cersei is a looming threat unknown to the rest of our heroes. The JSA's mission is to take the spear and bring it back to America, while at the same time, Wonder Woman's is to bring it back to the Mascara. This will create conflict within the group, and don't worry, Act 2 won't be as in-depth as Act 1 was, it was just really important to show the setup of this movie. So, starting off Act 2, we see the JSA deployed in France. The rest of the movie is the JSA not initially trusting one another and being skeptical of everyone's abilities. Wonder Woman learns to lead the team, which is going to be a skill that becomes very important in the future of the universe, and they go across Europe searching for clues as to the spear's new location. At the same time, Cersei rises from Tataris to seek out the spear. When Wonder Woman realizes how dangerous this mission has become, she realizes that she needs to change her mission and she needs to destroy the artifact rather than bring it back to her home. The rest of Act 2, we see that this group of people who couldn't be more different from one another with their personalities and powers, they grow to become a team that have more in common than they think. Eventually, we get a scene where the group must like infiltrate a top secret lab led by the German forces, and they've been conducting experiments on the spear, and in turn, sending a signal to Cersei as to its location. This whole movie needs to feel like it's a race to get to the spear before Cersei, as the witch sends her demon minions after the JSA. In the infiltration scene, we eventually get cut short when their cover is just completely blown. The group take cover and damage takes all the bullets, absorbing their energy to unleash a massive blast, decimating the whole room. Just as they're about to take the spear, Wonder Woman tells them that she's going to need to be taking it. When the JSA don't agree, there's a standoff. JSA against Wonder Woman. Tensions run higher than ever before, and on the brink of a huge battle, they're interrupted by Cersei. We have our first fight with Wonder Woman in the JSA against Cersei and her entire horde of demons. They lose the fight and Cersei gets away with the spear. Wonder Woman explains to them just how bad the situation is, and with an inspirational speech showing the JSA to put aside their differences and get the spear. Then we arrive at our final act. Cersei flies over Normandy, which is the location of our final battle, on June 6, 1944. 
D-Day. As the Allied powers prepare to storm the beach, Wonder Woman and the JSA arrive to help. Wonder Woman leaps ahead of the entire army and the JSA, taking on Cersei by herself while the JSA help invade the beach. This is where we see everyone's powers in full effect. The team works together and we finally understand their worth as a team, Wonder Woman bringing them together with their ability to have unbreakable hope and compassion. As the battle rages on, there's a turning point. Cersei is beating Wonder Woman and the Germans are winning against the JSA and the Allies. It seems as if all hope is lost. Then, Alan Scott realizes what must be done. He uses all of his power and charges straight in like a comet, hurtling towards a bunker that's been causing the most casualties. He hits the bunker at full speed, causing an explosion, killing him. Alan Scott sacrifices himself. The troops in the JSA use this as an opportunity to charge, and they eventually take the beach and secure a victory. Meanwhile, Wonder Woman fights Cersei. It's a vicious battle as both of them exchange hit for hit. Eventually, Wonder Woman comes out on top, defeating Cersei. As the witch lies on the ground, Wonder Woman offers her a chance at redemption. Unable to contain her evil, Cersei gives one last attempt to kill the Amazon with a blast of magic. Wonder Woman evades the blast and stabs Cersei through the stomach, which Wonder Woman then sits with Cersei and tells her that she's sorry for everything that's happened to her. She's sorry for the life that she's had to live for so long in constant pain and suffering. Cersei tells Wonder Woman that even after she's dead, there's always going to be a bigger threat, and all in due time there will be someone that Wonder Woman won't be able to defeat. Wonder Woman looks across the bloody and carnage-filled battlefield and feels a sense of helplessness, but also hope as she sees the soldiers celebrating their victory. Wonder Woman tells Cersei that she'll be ready. Back in Washington, D.C., the JSA are recognized as heroes, and Alan Scott is honored for his sacrifice. The group go their separate ways. Dr. Fate leaves to practice his magic in a remote location unknown to the others. Liberty Bell retires to be with her husband. The Flash retires his name, leaving it open to someone in the future. Damage also retires, wanting to move more into politics. As for Diana, she joins the United Nations as an ambassador for the Mascura, upon referral by Steve Trevor. She becomes the link between the Mascura and the rest of the world, declaring the island of Amazons as its own country. And that's my pitch for Wonder Woman Mortal Gods. This video took a while to make, so if you could show some support, that'd be great. Subscribe and become a channel member today, and I- wait, wait a minute. You want a post credit scene. Alright, then here we go. We open in the present day during a meeting filled with powerful world leaders. Diana Prince sits among them. This is UN meeting. They discuss the exponential surge in metahuman related crimes happening all over the world. Diana grows concerned, having already recognized this pattern. The next thing we see is Wonder Woman as she stands on a rooftop over a massive city. It looks familiar. It's bright and city streets are busy. Then a figure with a large red cape floats down behind her. You wanted to see me? Wonder Woman turns around to face Superman. I did. Long ago I was told that there would be a threat that I couldn't defeat. At least not by myself. Superman looks intrigued. What did you have in mind? Wonder Woman smirks. We need to put together a league. Superman smiles and the camera cuts to black. So the title of this project is going to remain relatively simple. It's going to be called Batman The Court of Owls. And more or less, the cast that I put into place for this Batman world in the previous video is staying the same. There's no changes. The only difference is, is a couple of people being added to this cast. So first, we're going to be having Gabriel Macht as Harvey Dent. We're also going to be adding Ana de Armas as Catwoman. And there's also another casting that will be revealed as the story progresses. The new district attorney, Harvey Dent, sits in his office late at night around 12 a.m. doing some paperwork. Paperwork and preparation for tomorrow's trial to put Tony Zuko behind bars for life. It's been six months since Batman and Robin had their run-in with Penguin and Zuko. As he sits in his quiet and dark office, Gotham City News plays a segment about the work that Harvey has been doing in Gotham. Gotham doesn't just have Batman to thank for cleaning up their streets, but they have Dent to thank as well. Seemingly a Annoyed, he turns the volume down on the TV, feeling as if he has done some good work, but more is indefinitely needed. Suddenly, gunshots are heard on the level below him. Being such a dedicated servant to the people of Gotham obviously puts a target on Dent's back, hence the police guards he has watching him down below. Where is it? What the hell is that thing? Are some of the things that Harvey Dent hears being said. Gunshots and what seems to be death screams are beginning to flood the majority of the noise. Dent grabs a gun taped underneath his desk and he slowly gets up and aims it at his office doors. Moments of silence feel like a thousand years as Dent waits for someone or something to barge through the door. And indeed, something does barge through the door, 
completely ripping the doors off their hinges. This thing, shrouded in darkness, stands at the entrance and stares at Dent. Dent fires three times, but this thing, that stands like a hunched over man, dodges all three bullets with ease. This dark being makes its way closer to Dent as it keeps dodging his shots and Dent eventually runs out of bullets. As this creature of the night gets face to face with Dent, it extends its arm with long, razor-sharp talons and prepares to strike. Just before it can get in its kill, bullets get shot from behind and pierce the creature's back. The creature lets out a high-pitched scream that makes Dent cover his ears in pain. It jumps on Dent's table and leaps out of his office window, escaping into the night. The gunman who saved Dent was Jim Gordon. Transitioning to the Batcave, Bruce sits at the computer doing research while getting a coffee poured out for him by Alfred. He's continuously researching his ancestry tree and still trying to figure out the mystery of the group photo he found in Penguin's Iceberg Lounge office. Alfred asks Bruce if he's made any progress in the investigation, in which Bruce says no. Everything he has on the history of his grandfather, all the outlets and history textbooks of Gotham City have no valuable information about Patrick Wayne being involved in business with mob bosses or secret cults slash syndicates. Alfred also notices Batman has cameras open on Selina Kyle in her studio apartment. He knows Bruce has missed her after he ended their relationship over a year ago. When he asks Bruce why he's spying on Catwoman, Bruce gives a reply of, just making sure she's not starting any trouble, which deep down is exactly what Bruce wants her to do. Sounds of sparring are heard in the background, where Alfred tells Bruce to take a break from his research and help someone else who may need it. Here is where we see Barbara sparring and training with new recruit and, might I add, adopted son of Bruce, Jason Todd, finding him only weeks after Dick Grayson's departure and already filling the void he left. Jason is good and honestly quite talented. He might have the rawest talent of anyone Bruce has found, but he needs to learn to utilize his talents intelligently. Jason is currently learning Japanese fighting styles with Barbara, in which he still has a lot to learn. He can be arrogant and too quick to anger, which does not help his cause. Bruce looks at them from a distance and tells Alfred, if he can't even land a hit on Barbara, he's nowhere near ready for me. Bruce then gets an emergency dispatch from Jim Gordon, asking him to meet at the DA's office. It was the creature again, Gordon tells Batman. Bruce Bruce gets up and puts on the mask and makes his way to the Batmobile. He tells Barbara to suit up and meet him at the DA's office and tells Jason to continue his training. Jason is obviously upset, but he is not ready for field work. At the DA's office, Batman overlooks the massacre the creature dealt out to the officers assigned to Harvey Dent's protection. A crime scene is waiting to be built while Batman gets first look and discusses next steps with Gordon. Harvey has been moved to Gordon's GCPD precinct and will be kept under 24-hour surveillance. But of course, this is not the first sighting of the creature. This is one of many over the past two to three months. The only difference is that this time, the target of the creature wasn't killed, whereas all the others have been. The same pattern persists as it previously did with Penguin. Important people, people who can significantly change the state of Gotham for the better, are being targeted. Gordon shows Batman the strength this creature had to rip the doors across the room and where he shot the creature. Noticing blood on the ground, Batman analyzes it. It's not red, but black, and has no particular scent to it. Using his detective mode to learn more about this blood, Batman learns it's a 95% oil-based compound mixed with 3% blood and 2% unknown materials. He activates Activates tracker mode to follow the blood trail of the creature when it jumped out of the office. Gordon proceeds to look at another part of the room where the doors were ripped off its hinges, and then looks back at Batman to ask how he plans on finding the creature, but Batman himself is already gone. A couple of blocks away from the DA's office, Batman follows the blood trail to a sewer hidden away in a dark alley. Before entering, Batman contacts Batgirl and gives her details on the situation. He tells her to keep an eye on Dent at GCPD while he continues to investigate. Heading into the sewers and following the trail, Batman hits a dead end. A wall where the blood trail ends, yet the creature 
isn't there. Batman once again activates detective mode and notices it's a secret door that once opened leads about 30 feet down. Batman of course figures out a way to open the door and uses his grapple hook to slow down his descent through this 30 foot drop. Landing on metal graded flooring and in a large and very dark open area, Batman continues to use his detective mode to scan the environment around him. He notices four creatures standing somewhat hunched over and sleeping, although their body structure seems no different than a human. Their breathing rate is faster than Batman has ever heard before, not to mention very loud as well. And think of I Am Legend, that scene where Will Smith walks into the abandoned building and all of the zombie-like creatures are sleeping and breathing very heavily. Noticing a fifth creature, which happens to be the injured creature, at the end of the room by a table and injecting something into its arm, Batman slowly makes his way towards it without alerting the sleepers. As he gets closer, extremely bright floodlights turn on and over a PA system, he hears an unknown person say, you're not supposed to be here. It's not your time yet. The particular creature Batman was tracking turns on him and the other four creatures wake up and begin to attack as well. Up close and personal, Batman gets a good look at these creatures. Black outfits and daggers and other throwable equipment attached to parts of their bodies like belts and packs, swords strapped to their backs, and what seems to resemble an owl mask. Go my talons, do your duties. Another announcement from the unknown voice. Fighting these talons, Batman realizes how physically strong they are. And whereas Batman could deal just as much physical damage, he chooses to use evasion techniques and uses gadgets for certain strategies to avoid winding himself. Doing solid damage to these talons, but realizing their durability to be increasingly heightened, they abandon the fight against Batman and flee through ventilation shafts. Of course, Batman would throw tracking devices on all five talons. Batman quickly returns to the surface, but just before he left, he takes the tube that the Talon injected into his arm. Contacting Alfred, he has him track the movements of the four Talons while he continues to track the one who went after Harvey Dent earlier in the night. The Talon Batman follows is going to Arkham Asylum. The Talon sneaks into the asylum and hunts down its target, approaching the cell and ripping it open. Racing towards the asylum in the Batmobile, Alfred updates Batman where the other Talons are. Three of them are heading for the GCPD, and the other has gone offline. Alfred alerts Batgirl to expect trouble, where Gordon shores up extra defenses around Harvey Dent. Batman arrives at the asylum to find many guards slain and certain defense systems destroyed. The Talon is now in Penguin's cell, as it almost sounds like it's torturing Penguin for information, where he says, I didn't say anything. The order remains intact. Batman uses his grapple hook to pull the Talon out and decides to resort to brute force in this fight. After what was a strenuous battle, Penguin lays beaten and in pain. I told you there were things I had to do, and there were others who will continue what needs to be done. Batman feels as if a bigger picture is coming together. Meanwhile, at the precinct, chaos ensues as the Talons attack. Interestingly, only one Talon seems to be focused on Dent. The other two are focused on Batgirl and Gordon. It seems each Talon is given a very specific target they cannot stray from. Throughout the fight at the precinct, Gordon and Batgirl put up a good fight, but Batman shows up just in time to tip the odds in their favor and to ensure the safety of Harvey Dent. With the Talons fleeing the fight and Harvey Dent showing his gratitude for his safety, Batman and Batgirl return to the Batcave. Here, here, Batman drops a bombshell. As they return out of the trunk of the Batmobile, he pulls out the body of the Talon from the Arkham incident. Batman heavily sedated the Talon after the fight in hopes to study what and who this is. He throws him on a medical bed near the Bat computer and takes his mask off. He looks like a normal man, other than the very pale look and black veins that surge through his neck and up to his cheeks. Although they notice something oddly familiar 
about the man. Batman places the injection tube he found earlier on a table and gets Alfred to start DNA testing. Suddenly, there's a ping on the Bat computer. The fifth Talon that went off the radar has re-emerged. Batman checks its location and darts into action so fast that Batgirl and Alfred don't even know what is happening. The fifth Talon is at the apartment of Selina Kyle. Selina sits on her couch, having a very ordinary night, as her cats start to meow very loudly and constantly. Most of her cats are facing towards the bathroom, which the door is nearly closed. Knowing something is very off, she grabs her whip and slowly walks towards the bathroom. She slowly opens the door and sees no one in the bathroom, until the Talon comes crashing down on her from the ceiling. Selina defends herself against an unknown enemy, but of course finds it very difficult. Batman eventually arrives in what she says what what took you so long, and helps her fight the Talon. Making the Talon flee once more, Batman is done with the cat and mouse chase, and decides to follow it back to its lair. It leads him back to the sewers, and that same room Batman initially found them in. The Talon escapes through vents Batman cannot squeeze through. He uses his detective mode to analyze the structure of the floor and notices the materials are breakable with enough force. He uses explosive gel to blow a hole in the ground and discovers something unbelievable. A couple hundred feet below, hollowed out beneath Gotham, is a lair, a secret base for these talons, a sizable one too. Even though he's shocked, Batman doesn't second guess anything and glides down to the surface. Landing in a dark corridor, massive floodlights turn on once again, and Batman seems to be stuck in a maze of walls with hundreds of talons surrounding his position. A man in a suit and an extravagant owl mask stands amongst the talons and says to Batman, now is your time. Batman races to find a way out and fights a horde of talons along that way. And I would use the nightmare scene as a reference for this scene, where Batman gets surrounded by a ton of Superman troops and parademons from Batman vs Superman. And during this scene, he is eventually overpowered and knocked out. One week has passed and Batman has disappeared. Day and night, Batgirl and Alfred have been searching all around Gotham for him with the assistance of Nightwing and Catwoman. Batman's suit tracker and any other gadget he may have had on him that could help them triangulate his position has been turned off. At this point, amongst all the worries of Batman, Alfred continues to steady the Talon that has been sedated for about a week in the Batcave. Alfred finally gets a hit. It was hard to find since their DNA has heavily been altered due to the black oil in their bloodstream, but Alfred is shocked and cannot believe what he's seeing. Calling everyone back to the cave, including Catwoman, because in this world, Catwoman is very much in the knowledge of who the secret identity of Batman is in the entire family. Alfred reveals the DNA structure to be a match to Dick Grayson. For this man is Dick Grayson's great-grandfather. As everyone is in shock and, quite honestly, weirded out, Alfred then explains what the injection tube is used for. It's basically a medical syringe, used to heal or pump in adrenaline. The difference is, is that this stuff runs through their veins. It keeps them mindless in the sense that they can't talk or question orders, but it also keeps them alive and in peak physical condition, considering he'd be over almost 120 years old. Now that they have this information, and Nightwing still trying to deal with the fact that this man is a distant relative, it's time to find where they're coming from. Bruce wakes up in a room that looks like it's from the late 1800s. Not wearing his bat suit, but just regular sleeping attire, he leaves the room and walks down a long hallway. Leading to the doors at the end of the hallway, there are portraits on the walls of old people who were once part of this organization, and portraits of great battles throughout history. Bruce walks through the doors and enters a massive room, decorated with a fireplace, multiple couches, many shelves of books and texts, a huge window wall that outlooks their sanctuary, and an office table at the end of the room. Sitting at that table was the man in the suit Batman saw before fighting the Talons and being knocked out. Even though to his memory, Bruce's experience hasn't been the best here, the man is very friendly and cordial to Bruce. Talking to Bruce and asking how he feels, 
Bruce is very stoic and on the defense. This is where all is revealed to Bruce. The man calls himself the leader of the Court of Owls, an organization that helped build Gotham City and has frankly been around for hundreds of years before its development, a cult that rules the surface from the underground as they see fit, explaining to Bruce that the Court of Owls has had run-ins and connections with some of the most notorious groups to ever exist in history, such as the League of Shadows, the Order of Saint Dumas, and even run-ins with ancient magic users such as members from the Sorcerer's Supreme. He explains to Bruce that Harvey Dent was being targeted by his talons because he was changing far too many things in Gotham, things that don't fit the Court of Owls' plans. He also admits that he wanted Bruce to be part of his plans, that Batman would help him immensely. And when asking the man why he sent Talons after his friends and loved ones, the man says that he believes they were slowing him down, and they don't have what it takes to be a member of this organization the way Bruce Wayne Batman does. The man then says to Bruce, you can be the future of the Court of Owls. He takes off off his owl mask, and Bruce is shocked, knowing he's seen this familiar face before. The leader of the Court of Owls is Alan Wayne, his great, great grandfather. And this is the casting I was secret about earlier. Alan Wayne would be played by Richard Armitage. Alan knows Bruce found the photo in Penguin's office, and that's how he somewhat recognizes him but he had no idea he was family. Two separate generations of family in one photo, and Alan looks no older than 40. Alan reveals that from past unions with the League of Shadows, he has a small reserve of the Lazarus formula, which has allowed him to stay alive for so long. The injection tube that Batman found earlier, which had 2% of a material he couldn't identify, is a small mixture of Lazarus properties, which is enough to keep the Talons alive. Alan also reveals that Bruce's grandfather, Patrick, died a loyal member of the court, but Thomas and Martha didn't. Bruce, of course, takes great interest in this, and Alan, of course, explains. After years of trying to appease and convince Thomas and Martha to join the order, they refused and wanted nothing to do with its corrupt politics. Unfortunately, Alan couldn't risk their popularity from the people of Gotham and the type of pull they had, so he ordered Carmine Falcone to hire a low-life thug to gun them down in an alleyway. Alan plays off how sad he feels to have made that decision, but Bruce, filled with anger, attacks Alan and for some reason feels unskilled and not capable of fighting properly. Alan grabs Bruce's head and slams it against the window where he sees many people wearing owl masks and an army of talons. Alan tries to tempt Bruce and tells him that if he joins, he can lead with him and that Batman can be an agent for the court. Gotham can be the base of the Court of Owls and one day can dictate throughout the entire world. Suddenly, Alan lets go of him and disappears. Bruce drops to his knees and begins to scream in pain. He is literally turning into an owl. Well, it turns out that even though that conversation was real, the setting wasn't. Bruce is actually on a medical table, being sedated, and behind a two-way mirror is Alan Wayne. The doctors can't seem to keep Bruce down, and he wakes up. Knocking out both doctors and staring at the window, knowing Alan is behind it, Bruce tells him he is going to destroy the court. Bruce races around the base in search for his suit and equipment, relying only on intuition and martial arts skills to keep himself defended from the court's henchmen who try to stop him. Bruce eventually finds his suit and activates the locator so that Batgirl and the rest can find him and give him some assistance. Batman, Batgirl, Nightwing, and Catwoman would have a massive fight against the Talons. Eventually, Batgirl and Nightwing would plant explosives around the base's perimeter to crumble the secret base, 
and Batman and Catwoman go to confront Alan Wayne in a secret laboratory. While the base is blowing up and the Court of Owls history crumbles with it, Batman begins to destroy Alan's work for the future, and destroys any progress he made in the attempt to replicate a Lazarus Pit formula. Throughout the fight and all the destruction, Alan gets a hold of Catwoman and puts a gun to her head, while he yells at Batman for ruining everything, and that that he wishes he had him killed along with his parents. Catwoman slips out of Alan's grasp and kicks Alan beneath a huge piece of the base ceiling that was falling. Alan Wayne, the leader of the Court of Owls, dies along with the Court of Owls cult. By the end, everything more or less goes back to normal. Bruce thanks Dick Grayson for coming to his aid. Batman and Catwoman re-enter their on-again, off-again relationship. Harvey Dent comfortably gets back to sentencing criminals and cleaning up Gotham streets. Dick Grayson properly buries his grandfather, who happened to be one of the Talons, and Bruce starts to pay much more attention to Jason Todd and train him in everything he knows. In the ending scene, we would get a usual and classical scene of Bruce at the back computer with Alfred making him a fresh cup of coffee. Alfred says to Bruce that it feels like things have gotten better in Gotham over the past couple of weeks. But Bruce, of course, feels somewhat differently. He is once again looking at his metahuman files looking at sightings and information of Superman, Wonder Woman, Flash, and others. He can't help but feel like something is coming. And of course, just like all the others, this film would have an end credit scene. Joker has a therapy session with Dr. Harleen Quinzel, who at this point is far gone from a sane state. Her mind has been completely corrupted by the Joker and is madly in love with him. There would be a conversation the two of them would have in her office of Joker's plan of action, and the screen would fade to alarms blaring, Arkham security scrambling, and Joker's cell opened with no Joker inside. The screen would fade to black, and Joker would continue to laugh. We open on Super Cafe, a new coffee shop in Central City themed to several new heroes popping up throughout the planet. It's pretty much this universe's version of Planet Krypton. We see a couple on a date. This was an interesting place to take me to say the least. Come on, you gotta admit this is cool. He responds as a waitress walks by in a Wonder Woman outfit. You do know that all these superhero guys are made up by the government, right? That doesn't make any sense, and by the way, I saw Superman and Metallo duke it out with my own eyes. We live in Central City, Chris. I think I would have seen the Flash by now. He's fast, Linda. That's his whole thing. He's so fast that you can't see him running by. It's like common knowledge that superheroes exist nowadays. How would you know that they don't? Because I just know. Speedsters don't exist. Creepy guys in capes. Well, they exist, but they don't call themselves Batman and aliens definitely don't exist. As she says this, a fleet of hawk-looking people float down in the distant background. Everyone in the area gasps and pulls out their phones to record. Once all the hawk people have landed, their leader steps forward. Hawkman. We cut to the Flash arriving at Central City Bank to stop a robbery being committed by a criminal who calls himself the Rainbow Raider. We got a rainbow guy now. That's cool. What do you do, ride a unicorn around and spread cheerfulness to all the boys and girls? I'll show you what I do. Rainbow Raider shoots a red blast at one of the bank tellers, causing him to charge at the Flash in rage. Wally grabs the teller and restrains him using duct tape. Dude, I'm the Flash. You thought just a guy running at average speeds would stop me. Just let me rob the bank. Only if you tell me your super sad backstory first. I love story time. I've always wanted to be a painter, but I'm colorblind. Wally lets out a chuckle. It's not funny, it's tragic. Oh no, you can't paint very well. I'm bawling. Come on, Roy G. Biv, it's time to go to jail. The name's Roy G. Biv alo, Buster. Wally stares in silence. Are you are you joking, or is that no? That's my name. So your name is Roy G. Bivolo. You're colorblind. You want to be a painter. 
and you have rainbow powers. Yes. Wally tries to hold back laughter. You won't be laughing after you see this, Roy yells as he creates a rainbow spiral that he slides up to escape, doing his best villain laugh. Wally is on the floor cracking up, before he handcuffs Rainbow Raider to a pull at super speed. What the hell? Let me go, I have a tragic backstory so it's okay for me to rob banks. Wally then frees all the hostages and walks outside. Another incredibly easy task for the Flau, what the shit, he says as he sees the Hawk people. Wally runs up to who he thinks is the leader of the Hawk people. Who are you guys? Wait a minute, Birdman? I'm like your biggest fan. We are the Thanagarians, a race of warriors hailing from the planet Thanagar. My name is Katar Hol. I am their leader. You are advanced from the other members of your race. I assume you are their leader. Oh yeah, uh, they call me the Flash. I'm like Earth's number one hero and I'm pretty much kind of like the leader of the whole thing. We have come to warn you. An enemy is coming, a destroyer of worlds. And he has an army bigger than you can imagine. You will need the help of my army to stop him. Wally looks around at the other Thanagarians. No offense, but that isn't much of an army. We then see millions of Thanagarians appearing all over Earth. Thousands of troops in every region. Are there any other people like you on this planet? Anyone else with special abilities? I mean, yeah, but they're like not as cool as me. We will need them. In order to stop this threat, we will need to bring them together. We cut to the suburbs of Metropolis and enter the house of a boy who is having his 10th birthday. Alright everyone, settle down. I have one last big surprise. Superman walks into the living room wearing a party hat. Someone told me that it's Jonathan's birthday. The kids go crazy and start jumping up and down. Superman makes time to talk and play with each and every one of them. After the party's over, he steps outside and sees the Thanagarians coming down in the distance. That's when he gets a call from Diana. Meet me in New York at 6 p.m. This is serious. Diana attends an emergency UN meeting where they discuss the Thanagarians, trying to find out how to handle the situation. After the meeting, she suits up and meets with Clark on a rooftop. Another top secret meeting on a rooftop. How many of these are we gonna have? Do you have any idea who these bird people are? Or more importantly, why they're here? I talked to Lois, she has some theories Already has an article on the way, but unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that. We need to be prepared. They could be declaring war. This is a better time than ever to assemble our team. Right, the League. So who are we going to call first? We cut to the Batcave. We see Bruce Wayne at his computer, looking over footage of the Thanagarians. So, Master Bruce, what do you think? As Bruce suits up in his Batsuit, he responds. I think that no alien can be trusted. As he says this, the back computer shows footage of Superman flying into Gotham. Superman and Wonder Woman arrive at an empty warehouse. How are we going to find this Batman guy? We know nothing about him. But I know everything about you. Superman, real name Clark Kent, Kryptonian name Kal-El, resides in 344 Clinton Street, Metropolis, Delaware. Wonder Woman, Real name Diana Prince, Themyscira named Diana of Themyscira, resides in 1241 Marston Street, Washington, D.C. Well, it appears you already know who we are. What's your name? Batman. Okay then, you're probably wondering why we're in Gotham. The aliens, the hawk people, they could mean immense danger for Earth. We're going to need protection if they're hostile. I'm making a team. I'm making a team. Hey guys, I'm making a team just wondering if y'all wanted to join. Wally says while well, passing out homemade invitations. Who? How did you find us? Oh, I just ran across like the entire world looking for people. I saw some weird shit. Do not go to the Las Vegas Fun Time Resort. It is not what it sounds like. I'm sorry, a team? A team for what? A superhero team. There's like impending doom or something. The leader of those bird people told me. You spoke to the leader of the aliens? Yeah, he had some. He said some big evil guy was sending his army down to find, like, some MacGuffin on Earth that would, like, give him all the power in the universe or something. I don't know. I honestly wasn't paying that much attention. 
This leader, how do we know if we can trust him? I guess you're just gonna have to. The Thanagarian walks into the warehouse. Hey, it's the Hawkman! I am the prince of the Thanagarians. Our homeworld was desecrated long ago by a species called Gordanians. They were searching for something. A jewel. A jewel that would unlock universe-conquering powers. The Gordanians are just henchmen. They were trying to retrieve this jewel for their master, the ruler of Apocalypse, Dark Side. This jewel is somewhere on Earth. My people are here to protect Earth from the Gordanians and help you prevent them from finding the jewel. Because if they do, we're all dead. We have no reason to trust you. There's no other option but to trust me. The Gordanians will be here soon, and if we're not ready when they are, the entire universe's blood will be on your hands. What was that? They all go outside and see a giant ship floating towards Earth. All of a sudden, green-winged creatures begin flying out of the ship, armed with weapons. The Gordanians. They're here. Hawkman extends his staff into a mace and flies up into the air to fight the aliens. Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman then follow pursuit. Hawkman bashes several Gordanians with his mace. Wonder Woman lassoes them up and uses her sword to slice through them. Superman punches them through the air and uses his heat vision to take a few of them out. And Batman takes them some out seamlessly, not even showing signs of injury. Meanwhile, Flash remains on the ground, trying to make sure no civilians get hurt in collateral damage. We cut to Oa. Jon Stewart is having a conversation with Kilowog when Hal Jordan interrupts. Jon, there's some disturbance on Earth. I thought I'd let you take this one. You sure? You want me to handle this on my own? It's probably nothing. Besides, I'm kind of caught up with something. Just check it out, resolve the situation, Everything is going to be fine. I know. See you soon. John flies off of Oa and heads towards Earth, unaware of what's in store for him. Back on Earth, Flash is moving people out of the way and stopping debris while the other heroes fight in the air. He sees a child who has their leg trapped in a boulder and phases him out. Wally looks up in the air and sees that the Gordanians are beginning to overpower the heroes. One by one, each hero falls down, including Hawkman. Meanwhile, Jon Stewart arrives near Gotham City and sees the Gordanian ship. Before he can make a move, he's hit in the head with a mace. Jon turns around and lands a punch on his attacker, sending them flying back. Jon is then able to see who he punched, a Thanagarian woman. The Thanagarian gets up. Sorry, I thought you were one of those Gordanian bastards. You're a Thanagarian. What are you doing here? We're here to stop the Gordanians from invading Earth. My name is Shaira Hall, Princess of Thanagar. All of a sudden, a Gordanian flies at them. Shaira is able to hit it with her mace, and the two of them fly towards the battle. John and Shaira quickly save the heroes from losing the battle and cause the Gordanians to retreat. Now do you believe me? I guess I have to. Hey, who are those guys? I'm John Stewart of the Green Lantern Corps, and somebody has got to tell me what's going on. And she is Shaira Hall, my eternal beloved. Oh, okay. Could have just said your girlfriend, but cool. After explaining everything to John, the seven heroes decide to form a team, a league. The next day, Linda Park goes on air and tells the public that the Thanagarians are friends, not foes. She adds that the Thanagarians are living amongst humans for the time being, which pisses off a lot of people. After getting off air, Linda meets up with Wally and takes a walk with him. Wally congratulates her for becoming a full-on reporter. Thanks, I can't believe it. I'm in the big leagues now. I guess I'm just stressed that since I'm in this position, if I screw up, the ramifications will be much worse. Yeah, I actually feel the exact same way. Later, Jon Stewart finds Hawkman and Hawkwoman and pulls them aside. Do you know what I am? I'm a member of the Green Lantern Corps. We're like an intergalactic police force. I don't know much yet, but if I'm not mistaken, Thanagarians are usually a warrior species. You conquer. You don't ally with others. What's going on? Why should I trust you? 
we were given no choice but to ally with humans. Darkseid is coming, and our alliance is the only thing that can stop him. If you don't trust me, then you're a fool whose death is inevitable. Gotcha. Hawkman storms off, but Hawkwoman stays behind. What's his deal? He has a very short temper. I'm always careful not to upset him. So, eternal beloved, that's interesting, isn't it? We're bound to each other. Even if one of us wanted to leave, we couldn't. What do you mean? A long time ago, there was a curse placed on us. Every time we die, we are reborn, reincarnated, and destined to find each other in our new life. If you're so connected, I'm surprised you didn't storm off in a baby fit like he did. You interest me. I wanted to talk to you. Really, out of all people, I interest you. Thanks, I guess. You were the first human I met. First time I met anyone that wasn't a Thanagarian, actually. Really? Don't Thanagarians travel a lot? I expected you met at least a couple other species. I'm not always allowed to leave Thanagar, but I've always wanted to travel the cosmos. You know what? When we get done with this whole situation, I'll show you around. Since I became a Green Lantern, I've been to some beautiful places, like Zarnia. That one's gorgeous. Well, it used to be, until the Scorpion incident. And there's Terminus. You know what? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm probably boring you. No, please, keep going. I want to hear about the universe. There's Ran. That one's pretty strange. Tamaran is beautiful. John tells Shaira about destinations across the universe for hours, but to her, it feels like minutes. That night, the League meets up in the Batcave. So, the Batman is Bruce Wayne. Who would have guessed? We need to find out when these Gordanians will strike next, and where this jewel thing is. I talked with the Mexican president. Apparently, there have been some sightings of a ship in the Sinaran Desert, similar to the ones we saw earlier. Chill, I'll go to the Sinaran and do some digging. I'll go with the kid, he'll need some help. I'm like 30 years old. The Gordanians aren't an easy enemy to fight. You'll need the assistance. Flash and Green Lantern head off to the Sinaran Desert. That leaves us. You never told us where this jewel is. Because we have no idea. It could be anywhere on Earth, but I assure you, every Thanagarian on the planet is looking for it. Maybe we could look too. The question is, what should we be looking for? The only thing you told us was that it's a jewel, which doesn't really narrow things down. Hawkman stares in silence for a few seconds. The truth is, I know nothing about it. We have a device that is able to detect it, its power, but only from a certain distance. Batman stares him in the eye. Mm-hmm. Wally and John arrive in the Sinaran Desert of Mexico, searching the entire desert until they find something. That's when Wally stumbles across the Gordanian ship, which seems to be powered off. Wally gets close to the front of the ship, and sees some language written on the door. He then taps into John's comms and tells him he found it. Wally runs his finger over the alien text, and the ship powers on. Of course, hooray. Thousands of Gordanians begin flooding out of the ship and attacking Wally. He tries to put up a fight and even takes out a few, but they end up outnumbering him. Before Wally can escape the Gordanian army, he is impaled through the chest by one and begins to bleed out on the ground. Just then, John arrives and fights off the horde of Gordanians. He uses his power ring to make two enormous machine guns and fires away at them, which ends up being very effective and clears his way to get Wally. John picks up Wally and puts him on his back as he uses the power ring to create a giant hand that swats away the Gordanian army. Wally makes his escape. Glad I came with you. You're my knight in shining armor, John. I feel like I could kiss you. Okay, too far. Back in America, Bruce is showing Hawkman around the Batcave. I'm sorry that we got off on the wrong foot. I really hope we can grow to be friends. As do I. I actually got you a gift. Bruce clicks on a button that unveils an upgraded version of Hawkman's vest. Thank you, but I can't accept this. Why not? My armor is made of nth metal a substance native to Thanagar. All Thanagarians must use it in battle. It allows us to fly. What if I told you you could wear both? Batman allows Hawkman to put on the vest 
and it integrates itself into his pre-existing armor. Now you'll be ready. John crashes into the Batcave with Wally in his arms. He needs medical attention stat, he's dying. Everyone crowds around, but Alfred comes by and makes them clear away. Bring him to me. Alfred is able to keep Wally alive, but he's still bedridden and injured. Superman is the first one to check in on him. Are you okay? I guess, it's just... I wanted to prove myself. My career has consisted of fighting guys with cold guns. I thought that since I was fighting alongside the likes of Superman and Wonder Woman, I had made it. But no, I'm still just a nobody. I can't even live up to Barry. Barry? Oh, just a friend of mine, I'm sorry. I shouldn't even be here. You should be here more than most of us, Wally, and you don't need to prove that. We can see how powerful you are, not only physically, but mentally. You're so much stronger than you think you are. Thanks, Supes. It means a lot. John goes to sit next to Shira, but Hawkman stops him. May I speak with you, John? Sure. Hawkman grabs John by the arm and pulls him to the side. Why did you tell Shira about the universe? I'm sorry? You told her about the wonders of the universe. Now she'll want to run away from Thanagar and explore the cosmos. Why is that a problem? Shira has never really liked being one of us. She disagrees with the way we do things. Tell me, John, are you a family man? I am. Then you know that family matters more than anything. Even if you don't like your family, even if your family are horrible people, even if your family murders, you must stay with them and stay loyal to them, because they're your family. You belong to them. Shira has to learn that. Do you understand? I do. Clark sits down next to Shira. You know, I'm an alien just like you. Yet, you fight for Earth and embrace humans as your people? Humans are my people. I was raised on Earth, in a town called Smallville. You know what? I should take you there. I would like that. Eventually, you'll learn to love humans, too. Yeah, they're rough around the edges, but one day, they'll grow to becoming your family. Shira sits in silence, and Clark doesn't know why, but a tear begins to fall down her face. That night, Shira doesn't sleep. She stares out the window and thinks about Clark, and she thinks about John, and she thinks about humanity. Then she thinks about Hawkman, and she thinks about the other Thanagarians. I have to leave. I can't do this anymore. She turns around and sees Hawkman standing in the doorway. You can't leave, Shira. We've talked about this. We're betrothed to each other. The Thanagarians are your family. You can't leave your family. I can't do this. We have to do this. This is the only way we survive. Hawkman extends his mace and swings it in front of her, trying to intimidate her. You can't leave family. As Hawkman and Hawkwoman argue, John Stewart stands in the hallway and listens. The next day, Shira trains with Diana. You're a fierce warrior. I respect that. All Thanagarians are. It's in our blood. So, your boyfriend, is he okay? He's been acting strange. Love is complicated. I understand. I had a love once. I miss him more than anything. Aren't you scared to fight these incoming enemies, I mean? We're all a little bit scared deep down, but as a leader and a warrior, I have to be strong, because if I'm not, my team won't be strong either. Enough training, it's time to go. Where are we going? Clark promised you a trip to Smallville, didn't he? Clark always keeps his promises. Come on, you'll love it. We cut to the Daily Planet, where Clark is about to leave with Lois. Kent, where do you think you're going? Lois and I are taking a trip to Smallville. The hell you are, you've been missing 24-7 for the past few days. Don't worry, Mr. White, I'll cover for Clark. I'll do twice his workload. I find it exciting. As they're leaving, Lois asks Clark if his frequent absences have anything to do with the bird people. How'd you guess? The entire team, except for Wally and Hawkman, meet up in Smallville. Why are we here? Is there something we need to accomplish? No, we're just here to have fun. Shira is shown around Smallville by Clark the entire day. She meets all kinds of people plays with children, tries the foods, and loves all of it. The people here are wonderful, it's so different from the rest of the Earth cities. Hometowns are like that. 
It's where you come back to visit the people you love and care about. Shira especially loves Martha Kent, who treats her like a daughter. When the sun sets, a bunch of the townsfolk meet up at a giant empty barn to dance, drink, and just hang out. Shira loves it. She dances with John and meets more people, and has the most fun she's ever had in her life. Before everyone goes to bed, Shira and John sit at the top of a hill overlooking Smallville. This Shira. This is what family is supposed to be. I think... I think I love Earth. I think I love humanity. But you have to understand that they're not my family. Thanagarians are. As much as I hate it, I have to stay loyal to my family. Shira begins to tear up. What do you mean, stay loyal? What's going on? Nothing, everything's fine. The next morning, Hawkman arrives in Smallville and alerts all the heroes. The jewel, we know where it is, but the Gordanians are there. Where is it? Antarctica, the exact point of the South Pole. The heroes suit up and make their way to Antarctica. Before they leave, Hawkman says that he and Hawkwoman will stay behind in case any Gordanians try to attack the rest of Earth. Okay, Shira, it's time. Time for what? John Stewart steps out of the shadows. What are you doing here? They'll need as much help as possible. Then maybe you should have gone. I don't trust you a bit. Neither do I. Batman steps out of the shadows next to John. You? I'm the world's greatest detective. I could sense your bullshit from a mile away. This is ridiculous. We're trying to save humanity and this is how we're repaid? We cut to Antarctica. Superman and Wonder Woman arrive at the exact South Pole. Sure enough, the Gordanian ship was right there. A strange, alien-looking doorway was right in front of them. Superman and Wonder Woman walk through the, and enter a strange hallway, lit with green lights, which takes them to a podium that has the jewel on it. Stop. It could be a trap. I haven't seen any Gordanians. All of a sudden, the doors seal behind them and the room lights up with green. Kryptonite. Superman falls to the ground. The kryptonite is so strong that it will kill him in minutes. That's when the Gordanians reveal themselves. They begin to attack the two heroes. Wonder Woman tries to hold them off, but there's too many of them and she can't fight them alone. It's over. Back in Smallville, John is yelling in Hawkman's face. I should have known. The Thanagarians are vile, barbaric creatures. We are the superior species. And her. What do you do to her? She's horrified to be a Thanagarian. She's afraid of you. Before John can say another thing, Hawkman snaps. He communicates with the other Thanagarians using a device on his wrist. It's over. Kill them all. All around the world, in every continent, every country, every city, the Thanagarians attack. They destroy everything. They kill everyone. Men, women, and children. Fyra stands there frozen. Hawkman drives his mace into the back of John's head. He tries to fly away, but Batman presses a button and all of a sudden he can't. What's going on? It's the vest I gave you. It's weighing you down, counteracting your inth metal. John stands up, his face covered in blood. Come on, Shira, you can fight against this. No, I can't. Just because I can't fly doesn't mean I can't beat your ass. Hawkman charges at Batman and starts a fist fight with him. Batman is surprisingly able to hold his own for a bit, but he's still overpowered. Hawkman rips the vest off with his bare hands and lifts Batman up by the neck, then flies off with him. Please, Shira. Just because they're your blood doesn't make them your family. Shira doesn't fight John. Instead, she just flies away. Meanwhile, in, in Antarctica, Wonder Woman and Superman are losing to the Gordanians. Then Wonder Woman remembers what she's been through. She survived so many things. She didn't live through World War II just to die to some green bugs. Diana hits the sealed door with all the strength she has, as the Gordanians are attacking her. Superman uses all the energy he has left to use his heat vision on the door, and with their combined might, they're able to break free with the jewel. They make their way back and see the chaos unfolding. Hawkman flies Batman all the way to Metropolis, dropping him to let him die. John Stewart then appears and catches Bruce using a giant hand he made with his power ring. Hawkman flies into John and begins to throw him and drag him through buildings, 
trying to cause as much collateral damage as possible. As they're fighting, thousands of Thanagarians are flying around, killing people and destroying things. You! Out of all of them, I hated you the most. I won't sleep until I see you suffer the slowest and most painful death imaginable. You're disgusting. I'm not gonna die to a wife beater. Hawkman drives his mace into a green leaper, sending him flying to the ground and knocking him unconscious. Superman flies at Hawkman and punches him to the ground, where he meets Batman again. What's the point of this? Why invade our planet? I didn't lie about Darkseid. He is coming and he'll kill us all. We need to be ready. Instead of allying, we're taking over, conquering every planet and stealing their resources so that we can become the superior race. Then we will truly be ready for Darkseid. You could just ally with other planets, create a bigger army. You know, Bruce, for the world's greatest detective, you really are an idiot. Look around. Not even one planet can ally with itself. How many wars has Earth had? How many times have people been greedy enough to kill millions over something as simple as a little more land? It's impossible to unite every planet, unless you want to start an endless war across the cosmos. And the Gordanians? The Jewel? All lies. The Jewel is just a common rock from Thanagar. The Gordanians are mindless creatures we use as slaves. We brought them here. Darkseid's army is infinitely more powerful than just some Gordanians. Superman punches Hawkman from the back and lifts him into the air. How dare you destroy my city, my people. These aren't your people. You're a traitor to even say that. Hawkwoman arrives and drives her mace into the back of Superman's head. Hawkman and Hawkwoman begin to tag team Superman, eventually overpowering him since he's still weak from the kryptonite. Wonder Woman is attempting to stop the other Thanagarians across the world, but there's millions of them, and there's no possible way for her to stop them all. She's eventually beat. All the heroes are on the ground. There's nothing they can do. The Thanagarians won. Wally lays in bed at the Batcave, watching the news. He sees that the Thanagarians are taking over and the heroes have lost. No. No, no, no. I've got to do this. I belong. I can do this. Wally pulls himself out of the bed, feeling excruciating pain, but he doesn't focus on it. He focuses on speed. He focuses on the lightning. That's when he sees it. In his mind, he sees pure speed. He sees pure lightning. Wally's eyes open and everything feels so different. I can do this. Wally blasts out of the Batcave faster than he's ever gone before. He races across the world and takes out Thanagarians like it's nothing. Even wounded, he is insanely powerful. He's the fastest man alive. It's a really cool scene of Wally taking down thousands of Thanagarians and rescuing the heroes from death. It looks like the world is frozen as he races across the globe, proving his power. Wally stops running and stands with the heroes, all lined up and ready to fight. How? We're just that cool Harvey Birdman. We're the Justice League. Damn, that's actually a slick name. Shira looks at the heroes all lined up. I won't do this anymore. I won't stand by you. What is wrong with you, Shira? The Thanagarians are your family. You can't leave your family, but you belong to them. The Thanagarians aren't my family. They are. Hawkman drives his mace into Hawkwoman's head. The Justice League quickly charges at him, and they all take him down at once. Thousands of Thanagarians fly down from the sky and try to protect their prince, but Hawkwoman fights them off. All of the Justice League takes their turn getting their hits in on Hawkman. Hawkman is weakened, and Shira flies down, landing a punch on his face. All my lives, I've been forced to be property of the Thanagarians. I'm done. I'm done being controlled by you. Shira drives her mace into Hawkman's face repeatedly. Tears start flooding from her eyes. Hawkman yells at the other Thanagarians, ordering them to stop her, but they do nothing. Even if you kill me, I will be reborn again and again and again, and I will always find you. We will be together till the universe ends and there is no escape. Good. And this won't be the only time that I can bash your head in. Hawkwoman prepares for the killing blow, but before she can land it, 
she feels a hand on her shoulder. She turns around and sees Superman looking down at her. It's okay, Shyera. It's okay. You're with us. Hawkwoman drops the mace and hugs Superman as she cries. Hawkman lies on the ground, bleeding out, until he dies. After embracing Superman, Shyera turns around and uses the device on her wrist to communicate to all the Thanagarians. Your prince is dead. I order every Thanagarian to leave Earth and never come back, along with the Gordanians. Following the princess's orders, the Thanagarians leave Earth and head back to Thanagar. I'm so sorry this had to happen. I will come back one day and make it up, I promise. You don't have to go back to Thanagar, Shyera. You can stay here. I have nowhere to go. And besides, humans will never accept a Thanagarian amongst them after all we've done. That's right, they won't. But we will, and that's all that matters. Besides, I have the perfect place for you to stay. We cut to Smallville. Clark and Shira arrive at Martha Kent's house and bring in some boxes. I'm so happy you decided to leave with me, sweetheart. You'll love it in Smallville. I know I will, Miss Kent. John Stewart arrives back on Oa and greets Hal. So sorry about that. I really thought it was just a small time mission. It's okay. I actually met some pretty cool people. Besides, I talked with the Guardians and they said that I could stay there full time and be the Green Lantern of Earth. That's awesome. Congratulations. After John leaves to go back to Earth, Kilowog approaches Hal. So you're not going to tell him? Oh, that the Thanagarians not only invaded Earth, but like hundreds of other planets and now I have to fix all of it? Nah, that would stress him out. Back on Earth, Bruce is showing Diana a Wayne Enterprises construction site. Is this Thanagarian metal? We're using materials that came off the Thanagarian ships. And what are you building? I'm building a satellite. A satellite for the Justice League. A watchtower, if you will. We'll be able to have eyes across the entire world. We'll be a Justice League International. We cut to Central City and see Wally having lunch with Linda, Barry, and Iris. So Wally, eventful week? Well, I think it's been an eventful week for all of us, hasn't it? I saw you on the news. You did? Yeah. Linda, she's a reporter now, isn't she? Oh, yeah. She's an amazing one, that. I've actually been hearing a lot of interesting stuff since I became a reporter. For example, that Thanagarian invasion has actually had a strong impact on politics. I heard that in order to crack down on alien invasions and metahuman attacks, Lex Luthor is going to run for president. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> In the post credit scene, Batman and Superman sit across from each other in the same super cafe we saw at the beginning of the movie. Why did you suggest this place? Because it's charming. You know that it's illegal, right? We never received royalties for all of this. Come on, just let it go. There is something I wanted to ask you. How did you know all that information about us? We had never met. Because I'm Batman. As Superman and Batman are talking, a giant purple and blue starfish floats down to Earth in the background. 